welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. This episode of the show is being sponsored by the Amazonian Plant Healing Center, the Temple of the Way of Light. I've worked at the temple for about the past decade now, and uh, I can really attest to the quality of the work that they do. Uh, they're working predominantly with the plant medicine ayahuasca, working in the Shipibo lineage. Uh, they run 12-day retreats where they have six ceremonies. Um, they're working with four healers, corenderos, doctors, uh, two to three facilitators, which are kind of like the bridges between the, the, the doctors and the guests that come down. Uh, there's yoga classes, uh, traditional massage, um, really just an amazing kind of support staff and an environment that allows people to go really deeply into this work and to get the, the things that they came to, to work on, whether... <clears throat> That's a, a healing of some sort, knowledge, self-discovery, purpose. Uh, they create a, a really amazing environment to do that work. So if you're interested in learning more about the temple, you can visit their website at templeofthewayoflight.org. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. They've unfortunately been closed since the pandemic started in March of 2020, but they should be open in August of this year. Um, and then also my friend and colleague, Marav Artsy, who I interviewed in episode, I believe, 28 of this podcast, are continuing to run dietas. Uh, we just finished one. We'll be running another one <clears throat> uh, in New York, in the U.S. in July. Uh, we'll be back here in September running a dieta. And then uh, we will probably be in Egypt in the Sinai Desert in October running another dieta. Yet is uh, one of the ways in which um, people go into and experience the, the, the healing and the teaching of plants on a very deep level. It's a period of isolation, of fasting, and of working with these plants to really maximize the benefits of those. So if you'd like more information about that, you can check out my website at nicotianarustica.org and Marav's site at tobaccodiets.com. There'll be a link to both of those in the show notes as well. My guest for today is my friend Adam, who I met working at the Plant Medicine Center, the Temple of the Way of Light. Uh, he originally came down working on his uh, doctoral thesis, uh, and he has a really interesting story. He ended up staying there, I, I think, for like five years. He's still there, uh, although with the pandemic, he's not there right now. Um, and he has done a lot of really interesting research. Uh, I think he's taken a really unique path where he kind of came in more with a, a, a research focus, and then he stepped into the role of facilitation and uh, working in ceremony, doing a lot of the work himself, uh, going into process of dieting. So I think he has a really unique and interesting point of view uh, bringing in that academic side, the medical anthropological side, as well as the experiential side. Um, we talked for quite a while. I, I think we went over three and a half hours, maybe close to four hours. Um, but I think you all will find this conversation really interesting. He has a, a very unique and, and I think important point of view. Uh, and he's really able to draw on a lot of his own knowledge, his own experience, uh, and shaping things in a really unique and interesting way. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. As always, if you're able to support this podcast, uh, that's a really big help to me to continue to bring on these guests. Patreon is a really good way. It's a subscription service <clears throat> for as little as a dollar a month. You can subscribe uh, and there's different tiers you can sign up for and it gives you uh, access to things like early access to shows, uh, bonus material, Q&As. Um, and it's a really nice way to, to, to support the show, to give, and then also to give something back or to, to receive something back. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. There's also the option of directly donating via PayPal. I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. And then if you're not able to do that, simply going on the YouTube page, subscribing to the show, turning on the notification bell, liking the videos, that's a really big help with the algorithms to get the show out to a bigger audience. And then with the audio version, going on Apple Podcasts, subscribing to the show, and if you're able to, leaving a starred rating and a review, that's also super helpful with the algorithms for the audio podcast version. So I think that's it. To all the people who have done that, thank you very much. To all the Patreon subscribers, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate your support. Um, and I think that's it. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Adam. I'm running out from the maze. Running out from the maze, running out of the maze today. Running out from the maze.
from the maze Running out from the maze Running out from the maze today I'm running out from the maze Running out from the maze Run out of the maze today Cool, man. It's it's good to see you. It's been it's been a little while. Uh, we were yeah. just talking uh, the last time I saw you. We were uh, quarantined for about four or five months together in the jungle, which <laughs> was uh, quite quite the experience. Um, so I would imagine a number of people watching this have they they're either familiar with you or maybe they've seen you. Um, and then a, a big chunk of the audience probably has no idea who you are. So maybe to start just a, a bit about your background, who you are, where you're from, what, what brought you to, to this line of work. And um, for people who don't know, we, we met working together, like a number of my guests, uh, working at the Amazonian Plant Healing Center, the Temple, the Way of Light. Uh, from, from what I know, you, you came down originally doing your, I guess, your thesis and research, and then you ended up facilitating. So yeah, I guess just a bit about the backstory about who is Adam and, and what, what brought him down to the, the jungles of the, the Peruvian Amazon. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, as many Western subjects, anything that has to do with me, something I would gladly talk about. Uh, <laughs> uh, how, how I came to this work is actually something that I don't really have an answer for, something that I come like, thinking about constantly. Uh, okay, well, let's start from the beginning. So, my name is Adam. Hi, everybody. And yeah, I mean, I kind of like, I, mean, I was born in Mexico, grew up in Israel, have lived in many different countries, kind of have a very strong uh, intercultural grasp in my life experience. Um, and I guess like from a very early age, I've always been interested in the human experience in all of its different dimensions, particularly kind of like the intra-psychic um, mental experience of it. I mean, what is awareness, consciousness? What does it mean? To be a human, uh, or what does it mean to be sentient and conscious with this meat suit? Um, and one of the things that were very instrumental in my early adulthood or teenage years was uh, when I found psychedelic substances. And <clears throat> I remember actually like one very early. LSD experience that I had when I was probably around 20 or so, uh, 20, 21 actually, but just right out of the army. Like I spent as, as many <laughs> Israelis army and there's a rite of passage within Israeli culture or Israeli society where both men and women, right? So after the army, uh, which for, for many is three years minimum, for women, it's two years nowadays, uh, except if you sign up to be an officer, which I was. So there's kind of this rite of passage, whereas after the army, uh, Israelis go out into the world. Anybody who's been in India or Southeast Asia or South Asia or South America has met like these hordes of like very obnoxious young Israelis just being noisy and, you know, uh, no judgment. So there's this rite of passage, right? And part of that rite of passage is kind of like, well, we just served three years in a very, very constrictive authoritarian environment where we were told what to do, but you know, like let's go out there and like do whatever we want to do and explore the world in our own terms. And India kind of like became the default option for many people, I guess because it's accessible and cheap, and also because it offers like a whole range of psycho-spiritual experiences for people, including drugs. So drugs is a big part of that rite of passage. It's kind of like an implicit uh, aspect of that Israeli rite of passage. And I remember, I think it was actually my first LSD experience, right? Where I had like, this mind blowing moment where like, okay, I'm in this you know, journey after the army, I need to like decide what my next step was. What is the thing that I'm really interested in? What is the thing that I want to do? I was like, well, you know, within like the journey of the LSD and like the mental aspect of it or the psychological component of it, well, the only thing that makes sense for me is like, I want to I wanna learn psychology. Like I want to learn about the mind and all the different aspects. And that's what I did. I went 
uh, the university. I started learning uh, psychology, cognitive science, like everything that had to do with cognition, mind, and so on and so forth, and working at the same time already. Like I, I was uh, signed up to work in a mental hospital. And my first experience working with people very early on was working with people who were diagnosed with psychotic disorders, which I mean, back then I didn't really understand what that meant, except that people with schizophrenia were considered to be uh, those people who, let's say, had gone over the edge, who got a little bit too close to that edge of sanity and flipped over, right? And they were like already on the other side of that divide that Western society made between sanity and insanity, normalcy and abnormal. Um, so for many years, I worked with schizophrenic people who were diagnosed with schizophrenia, psychotic people, so on and so forth, mental institutions, tutoring relationships, also different environments. Uh, and as I went along with it, I started also realizing, uh, let's say, all the shortcomings of the prevailing psychiatric paradigm. Like things became very, like very quickly, they became very evident to me. And I was like, well, I really enjoy working with people. I really enjoy like the relationship, like the relational aspect of this work, like connecting with a person, listening to their stories, their narratives of affliction, what has happened to them in their lives. Uh, you know, what, uh, what do they attribute meaning to in their suffering? But at the same time, I didn't really feel like I was really helping them to the best of my ability. Like the psychiatric approach was very limited. It was basically pathologizing, like invalidating people's experiences, medicating them in order to make them fit within kind of like a very well-established notion of what normal and sane was, not really meeting the person in front of us, but actually just meeting the diagnosis meaning like the pathology, like whatever was the label, like, okay, I'm working with a schizophrenic person or I'm working with a person who has borderline personality disorder or schizotypal personality disorder, but you know, like underlying that diagnosis is actually a whole human being with a whole history, a whole biography, uh, relationships, family, all, you know, like everything that it entails being human. So at some point I kind of got really frustrated. I was like, well, fuck that shit. Like, I, you know, I really want to work with people, but I don't want to be an agent of social control, just drugging people and telling them like, hey, like your experience is not valid because it doesn't conform to our standards. And I have an intuition that there must be other ways in which other cultures or other people uh, approach the subject of human suffering and mental distress in particular. So after I, finished school i left my work and i started traveling and for four years i just traveled a lot i went to india for a year um i spent time in sri lanka which i know is uh, on uh, history i spent a lot of time in mexico and peru that's like my first encounters with plant medicines and ayahuasca so and so but the question that i always had in mind was related to human suffering right like how different cultures how different people approach like this very vast subject of mental disease, mental illness, emotional distress, human suffering, hold people into labels and categories and taxonomies of disease, but actually sees like a more holistic framework. Uh, so that was kind of like the idea. And I went back to school after four years. And from then onwards, I kind of went back to mental health, but not necessarily from a clinical perspective or a psychological perspective, but rather from the framework of medical anthropology and cultural psychiatry, which are branches which look at medicine, not necessarily, again, from a clinical perspective, but more as an outshoot of a more general culture. So we're looking at like the metaphysics of a particular culture, or the epistemics of a particular culture, like how, the, how that culture conceives of the world, what is the world made of, how do people uh, process knowledge about the world and how illness and disease emerge from like that worldview and then both like the diagnosis but also the treatment and everything about that kind of complex thing has to do with like the more complex worldview of a culture as opposed to just uh, reductive approaches. So in a sense, um, 
yeah, I'm just kind of like looking for the deeper roots of affliction beyond just like easy explanatory systems that are usually provided by Western psychiatry, which are oftentimes blaming the individual for their own thing. They're like, well, our brains don't function as properly. We have like a neurochemical imbalance. We don't have enough serotonin or we don't have enough dopamine. So we need to take this pill to kind of like balance out like our uh, neuros like our, our neurotransmitters levels, but not really looking more in depth about the actual history, biography, uh, wishes and hopes and dreams and, you know, like stories that that individual makes about the world and their place in it. So I think that's kind of like a very um, long run of like my background into it. Uh, but, you know, from that approach, from wanting to understand more deeply about human affliction, particularly as that is lived by other people who are not uh, Euro-American white people, again, like I'm not like aligned with identitarian notions at all, but there's a concept that I actually do find very useful, which is by, uh, I think it's Nace Heinrich, which came, coined the acronym WEIRD. So the experience of weird, which is white European industrialized rich democratic people, which oftentimes we tend to assume that it's universal. So most Western academia is based around weird understandings of mental affliction, healing, disease, and so forth. I was really interested in seeing like how other non-weird or uh, non-white educated industrialized rich democratic people we see the same things. Of course, Amazonian people are like one very good example of non-weird people. Um, so yeah, I arrived at the temple with the intention, not necessarily of researching ayahuasca per se, but rather of getting a better grasp of different ideas or different views or different approaches to what mental health can be beyond the very reductive, hyper-individualistic paradigms of Western biological psychiatry. And being there, of course, I started like really getting interested, not only in that, but in like the whole edifice of Amazonian medicine. It's super interesting by the other day, and particularly like really missing that connection that I had working with people. So eventually I did step into facilitation. So in a sense, like my research is informed by three different strands. The first one being more like the detached observer, academic, kind of like third person analysis. The other one, uh, like the participant observation as, of me as an actual facilitator, running these retreats, interacting with, with the guests, interacting with the people healers. And the third one also, of course, as an apprentice, of vegetalismo, uh, dieting within the boundaries of this very particular uh, system of magical, medical um, approaches. So it's kind of like the three strands that kind of like inform my experience. Yeah. So when you when you first arrived <coughs> to the to the jungle, you were already working on your thesis. Um, I had the idea of it already. Like I like I had kind of like. Um, talked about it with, with my tutors, I had, but I hadn't like actually signed up for it. It was kind of like a preliminary uh, research, a preliminary investigation for me to see what the field work was actually like, what the possibilities were like. But I mean, I did have that in mind already, but it took me, I think, a year uh, or a couple of years until I actually officially became a PhD student, yeah. Mm -hmm. And is that something you've you finished now, or you're you're still working on it? Well, I'm, I'm now in the last stretch of it, which is actually uh, writing the dissertation. So, yeah, I mean that dissertation is kind of like based on again like these three strands that I just mentioned. Now, a big part of that is research collaborations that we've been doing at the temple with other uh, three big well-known research institutions. Okay. We have one collaboration with ICIRS, which is the International Center for Ethnobotanical Education Research um, and something, uh, yeah. So 
that research was the one that I initially was more attached to. And actually, when I first came to the temple, I was responding to a job offer that was posted on social media that I was forwarded, I think, through friends of mine in ICERS. I think the temple, I think actually it was Chaikuni. The Chaikuni Institute was looking for uh, people to work in uh, research, communication, something. So that's what I applied for. But eventually, after I had like interviews with the relevant people, uh, it was decided that actually there was going to be a role that was going to be tailored to my particular interests and skills. So things shifted a little bit, but uh, initially um, that research with ICERS was kind of like part of the initial plan. And that from that research, um, part of the insights that I had while running those interviews, I mean, a big part of that research was the qualitative part, which was not only necessarily uh, numbers, statistics, so and so, but actually like interviewing people, like people that have been through retreats and workshops at the temple. And then it was very important for me to talk to them, like face to face, like, hey, like tell me how was the workshop helpful for you? Like, what were the things that you find particularly interesting? Uh, what were your intentions? What were the things that you were struggling with before you came to the jungle? Why did you decide to come to the jungle? Have you tried anything before? And then getting like in people's own words, their own narratives to tell me uh, what about that workshop was particularly interesting or particularly beneficial. And I think that was very illuminating because it was, it was very surprising in many ways. And from, from, from those interviews, I started calibrating the next collaboration, which would be with Imperial College. So with ICES, we were very focused on ayahuasca as, uh, as a thing, right? Like people come to the jungle, they drink ayahuasca, and ABC happens, right? But of course, when you talk with people, you start like, or, or you're working in the temple, I mean, you start realizing very quickly, uh, ayahuasca is not a standalone thing, isolated from the world that you just drink. I mean, it's not the same paradigm as Western pharmacology, where you just take a substance and something happens. There's a whole context, which is at least equally important as a substance. Right, there is interventions that we do as facilitators, there's group shares, there is interventions that the healers do, right? Like all of the flower bats and uh, vapor bats, and there's like the group interaction, and there's like people talking to each other, and there's like the connections and bonds that are formed between people. Like there's many, 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 many components to a workshop that don't necessarily reduce to just ayahuasca does such and such. Right, but ayahuasca maybe is one part of a much wider set of interventions. So what I was really interested was to unpack a little bit all of these different things, right? Like what are the things beyond just ayahuasca that actually are very, very beneficial for people, at least people report as being held by. Um, and the primary dimension or one of the things that was really evident for me very early on is that a lot of people really uh, benefited or appreciated the relational aspect of this work. Like for many, many people, it wasn't so much about what we would expect coming from a very medicalized perspective. Like, okay, you drink ayahuasca, you go into your childhood trauma, you process all of these different things. And the, it wasn't so much about that, but rather it was like, oh, like the relationships that I made during that workshop were like really, really, really powerful because, uh, you know, for a very long time, I have felt really lonely, really alienated. I don't really have a very strong social network back home. And I feel that now I have this experience of what happens when I meet somebody on a soul level where we're both allowing ourselves or both or like a lot of people allowing ourselves to like really be vulnerable and really be authentic and express how we feel and, and, our, and like really penetrate like those layers of whatever defenses defense mechanisms we have in society so i think like that communal experience of doing something together that we everybody is here 
on a shared mission and a collective mission of healing and growth and then like talking about it and interacting with each other and finding like hey like i'm not alone in the world my suffering there's other people in this world who also struggle with depression who also struggle with anxiety who also struggle with feeling disconnected who also struggle from not finding meaning in kind of like modern culture hey like it's not only me there's other people and we can talk about it and we can process this thing and just that sense uh, of community or communitas that arises uh, was one of the main things that people reported back to me right like it's really really powerful experience so with imperial the focus was precisely more on the social component of the workshop, not so much of ayahuasca in itself, but rather like the whole dynamic of the workshop, emphasizing the social dynamics in that sense of a rising community that gives people uh, a lot of hope. And I guess for many of us, it is relatively new. You know, like there's something that I've been thinking about for the last few years, just like the role of loneliness. Um, in Western experiences of affliction, just how loneliness is really such a permanent fixture of Western lives in many ways. Um, a few years ago, there was a, I, re I was reading a newspaper and I remember, this is like maybe two or three years ago, I remember reading uh, Theresa May, who was like the former prime minister of, of uh, Great Britain. Theresa May appointed a minister of her cabinet to be the Minister for Loneliness of the UK. And there was a person in the UK uh, government whose role was to address the epidemic of loneliness that Britain was going through. And then kind of this has cascaded like different countries around Europe and like the Western world started paying much more attention to loneliness, not just as a isolated experience, but actually as one of the main risk factors uh, for public health. And then there's like a bunch of different articles that were written about how loneliness is actually uh, more, more a big risk factor than obesity and like a bunch of other things. And kind of like loneliness started emerging just from kind of like the shadows of some individual experience. They were like, hey, like, no, actually loneliness is a main factor of why we're experiencing the epidemics of, of um, anxiety, depression, like all of these things are very much rooted in this ongoing erosion of our social connectedness, you know, living in a world that is very, very much invested in constantly dissolving, right? Like our sense of belonging to each other. So, so yeah, like that, that role, which for me is very interesting because actually, you know, like that social component has been forever pretty much a very central aspect of ayahuasca and plant medicine and psychedelic use in traditional societies for a very long time. Like this is not something, we're not discovering anything new. We're just kind of like remembering like, hey, yeah, ayahuasca can be a great thing for introspection, for, you know, self-knowledge, for, you know, like we, what we call doing the work, or like doing the individual personal deep work that we so much emphasize, but actually right, a, a big part of its power is not so much in the intra-psychic, intra-personal individual experience, but in that sense of community, in that sense of social bonding, in that ritual that brings a group of people together and gives them a sense of collective purpose. So that's been kind of like one of the things that I've been really interested in when doing this work. And I mean, you know, I'm sure that you as a facilitator has heard this many times, you know, when we're doing like the sharing circles and this is something that people will express very, very often, you know, like, wow, like, you know, like I didn't know that other people were struggling with the same things or, um, you know, thank you for sharing that because just hearing you saying that kind of gives me the strength to whatever. There's like a very strong sense of like, you know, the work that we're doing here is simultaneously very deeply personal and individual, but at the same time, there's a collective dimension of it that is very central. And that collectivity implies like a degree of uh, mutual responsibility and reciprocity that is very important to recover in Western mental health settings, right? Like that idea that 
yes, it is important to do our work. It is important to work our traumas. It is important to kind of like have like a degree of introspection, but at the same time, nobody can be happy and healthy unless uh, everybody else is happy and healthy because the nature of interconnectedness right, is such that we're not isolated beings inside our, like the solipsism of modern life in which we tend to think that we can like encapsulate it within our individual awareness. Like, no, you know, like, okay, we can do our work, but unless our environment, unless our community, unless the society that we live in, the culture of which we are part of, and of course the environment which sustains us, unless all of these different layers of being are also healthy and also balanced and also uh, harmonious and reciprocal, then it becomes very difficult for the individual person to feel happy, healthy, balanced, and harmonious just because these other layers uh, add in. So it's just kind of like this constant dialogue between individual community, individual society, individual environment, so on, that I think is one of the main things that we have lost sight of in Western uh, medical settings. That's kind of like the gist of it. Yeah. Before you came down <clears throat> to the jungle um, and you were you were in university, do you remember or did you have a like a clear vision of, of what you thought your thesis was going to be and and then have you so no is <laughs> so then when you when you came down I mean I imagine, I mean, part of any any research or anthropological endeavor is is obviously observation and being open to change. So, do you do you have a sense, or do you remember how that began to evolve, or how you began to kind of I don't know what the word is like make more concrete or, or kind of envision where your work was was going? Was that something that that developed while you were on the ground, like taking in? your own experience, your own observations, and then how did that, how did that come to, to mold into your thesis? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I had no idea uh, what that work would look like. I mean, I, I don't still have a very clear idea of what the end result is going to look like. I have a more defined vision of it, but I mean, yeah, these things are constantly evolving. I think um, one, of the, one of the most important aspects of how my own vision of things evolved was obviously when I started working with ayahuasca more intensely. I arrived in it. I mean, I have I have had experimented a lot with different substances, psychedelics, mushrooms. I work with different channels in different places. Ayahuasca for a period of time, uh, but of course, living at the temple, being in the jungle, having like you know, access to ayahuasca as much as we have, um, you know, being encouraged to diet and kind of like go apprentice within the vegetalista system. I mean, all of these things have been hugely uh, influential in many different ways. Um, and I think this is something that Maybe my directionality is the opposite of what most people uh, would experience. Like I came to the jungle still with a very romantic and idealized vision of what ayahuasca was and what indigenous people in the Amazon was. I almost kind of like still expected that I was gonna like get off of the plane in the Iquitos airport and I was going to be met by people with feathers and bows and I mean, not really, but sort of, you know, like I, I still was very attached to this idea of like, oh, I'm going to be working with like really authentic people with really authentic medical systems, you know, like pristine ideas and ways of being in the world that haven't been, you know, as polluted by Western whatever, uh, which of course is a pipe dream that you know, evaporated very quickly as, uh, you know, as I actually started meeting people and having conversations with Amazonian people. Uh, crafting like real relationships with Amazonian people, whether mestizos or Shipibo or you know, so far that you realize, well, okay, you know, like I didn't have like a pretty idealized uh, notion, not only what people were like, but also like what this work was about, right? Um, and I think like I still had a very, this is, this is kind of like, tricky to express because 
I don't necessarily like saying new agey. It's not, a, it's not a term that I would prefer to use because it's a very complex term to be unpacked. But I, I can, in a way, I did have like a very kind of like new agey view of things. Whereas I was still following mindlessly to some extent many of the narratives and stories that I was being told about what ayahuasca and plant medicines were and what they were for. Uh, that follow kind of like this logic of new Western spiritualities that have been emergent in the West for the last many decades, right? Um, I mean, I'm gonna try and unpack that as we go along. But uh, I think one of the things that is the most, one of the most important processes that I've gone through is that I started like really shifting my own personal approach to the mystery in a very significant way. My friend Olivia actually, who is also, I mean, she's already actually a PhD uh, anthropologist. She's a medical anthropologist. She, she's been to the temple uh, as part of her field work, but she once said something to me that may sound harsh to some people, but actually for me, it was like a aha moment. And she said, you know, the more that I work with ayahuasca, the less spiritual that I become. Um, and you know, like, like the way that that resonates for me is not so much about like becoming less spiritual, but about letting go of many attachments to spiritual fantasies that I may have had before that. Like ayahuasca more than a, I mean, like the work that I've done the last few years in, if I could like, um, conceptualize it in some ways, like more a work of in real men, of like becoming more real and shedding more layers of illusion and more layers of fantasy that have kind of been lodged in my perspective of what things are. And this is like a very broad subject, not only about like spirituality, but also about like, you know, society and politics and culture. You know, I mean, I, I came to the temple like very attached to a leftist liberal identity, which was completely evaporated. I mean, not completely evaporated, it was definitely shifted in many ways. You know, so like in all of these different aspects of my identity, there's been a definite process of letting go of many um, stories. And I think this is kind of like the main core, like the main seed of the world, the way that I perceive it, the way that I like to pass this on to other people is precisely that's like hey like you know like we are made of stories like the story that we tell ourselves about who we are what the world is like what exists around us um there are narratives there are fictions that we create as we go along so a big chunk of this work for me has been precisely like that narrative deconstruction work like well what are my beliefs? You know, where are my prejudices? Why are my preconceptions about the world and my place in it and the work that I'm doing? And just like really examining those things and taking them apart. So the epistemic dimension of it, like the, the, the knowledge aspect of it, like how do I know what I know and what grounds do I have to believe in what I believe? And so on and so forth. I mean, that has been kind of the main thing. So again, like going back to Olivia's statement, which for many people will be like, you know, like, what does that even mean? Uh, the more that I drink ayahuasca, the less spiritual I become. For me, that means that the more that I let go of notions about what spirituality means that I have absorbed from whatever stories are prevailing in our culture, and the more that I craft my own personal individual relationship with the mystery, uh, the unknown, the paradox of being human, uh, and, you know, that search for meaning in, a, in, in many ways. Like, like really um, getting more clarity about what that human journey is like with as little external preconception as possible. So yeah, to your question, I mean, that has obviously kind of influenced a lot of both my personal life, but also my relational life, my professional life, my academic uh, life in a sense that whatever I thought I was, or whatever I thought the world was like, or whatever I thought ayahuasca was for, or what mental illness and mental disease and human suffering were like. I mean, all of those things have shifted radically throughout the four years, partly because of uh, my own work with ayahuasca and other plant medicines, part of, 
part of that because of working with other people and like really having like much more closeness to the suffering of many other people and their own stories and their own meaning making devices and so on and so forth. So yeah, I think if I had written the book that I'm writing now four years ago, it would have been a completely different book. It probably would have been something that I wouldn't even be interested in reading myself. Well, you know, I think that's natural. Um, four years, five years, three years, particularly when you're engaged in something as intensive as kind of this constant uh, self-analysis can be pretty intense. Yeah. I know oftentimes uh, people don't like being asked questions about their thesis because it, it, it seems like too grandiose of a topic, but it, can, you, can you summarize in a way to the audience uh, like what that is or at least the direction that it's, that it's come to and, and what you've, yeah. you know, I don't want to say necessarily come to the conclusion of, but, but where, that, where that's led you to? Yeah, well, I mean, the reason I chose, one, one of the main reasons why I chose anthropology as a field of study is because deep inside me, what I really want to do is uh, be a writer, right? Like that is, yeah, like what I'm kind of like, like really connected with what it is that I want to do, what like really lights me up and the gifts. And by the end of the day, writing is the thing that I like. Uh, ethnography is a modality that allows for a lot of creative freedom. So in a sense, uh, anthropology allows me to create something that can be accessible and can be enjoyable and can be beneficial, not only for a handful of people in the ivory towers of academia, but actually for the world at large. So that's always been my main motivation. And the one condition that I always have, both with my thesis directors and everybody uh, in my department was like, I'm not gonna write something that has academic merit, but has no reach. Like what I, whatever I end up writing, I want that to be a uh, work for the general public. So again, like something that can be enjoyable and something that can be readable and something that can be beneficial for a wide range of different minds and not only very specific minds that have you know, gone through the trouble of learning like that specific jargon and those thinkers and those ideas. I mean, academic work, in my in my perception now, like in the world that we live in today, unless it has an immediate impact in the real world, it's pretty much worthless. And I think that's one of the kind of great fallacies of modernity. Is like we think that because we're writing something, I mean, whatever. The, the, the main point is like I'm writing a book for people. I'm writing a book for you, for me, for everybody else, for my mom. Like when I'm writing, like I always have like that. You know, like there's like this saying like when you're writing, you always have to have in mind who is your public, like who are you writing for? So I always have my mom, you know, I'm writing like, okay, will my mom understand this? Will she enjoy it? Or will she be like, hey, I don't know, what does that mean? So, so it's, a, it's a book, it's a story. Yeah, I mean, ethnography in many ways is based on observation, but um, it's a fiction. Like ethnography is always fiction because it comes from the view of one person in a sense. I mean, it can be objective in some ways because it is based on, participant observation, it is based on qualitative and quantitative research that we've done through the years. Like it has like a very good routing on a sense of reality, but by the end of the day, it would be a little bit arrogant to say that it is objective. I mean, it is my view, it is how this work filters through my own gaze, right? Which is clouded by my bringing, my own trauma, my own prejudice, like all these things playing together. So I, I always felt that ethnography is the most honest uh, way of writing about things because it has to inherently acknowledge the bias and the personal preferences, right? Like the aesthetic preferences of what he's writing and so on and so forth. So right off the bat, maybe that's kind of like a cowardly thing to say, but I don't expect that work to be taken too seriously by people in the sense of like, oh, like Adam says things are such and such, so they must be such and such. So it's rather like, hey, like this is entertaining, this is, you know, uh, helpful, this is like illuminating those certain things, but it is by the end of the day, 
a fiction that somebody wrote based on their own experience of a certain thing. So yeah, I mean, it has different components to it. I think it's gonna, it's, I mean, it's kind of like structure in different chapters, which try to blend in uh, different components of the kind of work that we do. Uh, and a big part of it is like bringing the voices of the people who are part of it. So it's not just me writing in first person all along, but there's like a lot of like the inter like I mean, in the last four years, I've probably done somewhere around 100, 120 interviews with guests, like people that have attended a workshop at the temple after the workshop, uh, I interview them and then I have like, you know, like a whole treasure of people's narratives. So I, like a lot of that is gonna be like also like people's uh, narratives, like their own perceptions of a certain topics. Uh, and the things that I'm gonna focus on in each chapter change depending, but I mean, there's many things that I've already kind of like mapped out that I really wanna focus on, obviously, I mean, mental health is the focus. So like really hoping to convey uh, a better understanding or a more broader uh, approach to what human suffering is like. Uh, depression, anxiety in particular, because these are the things that are really at the crux of the thing. Uh, you know, but again, like bringing from my discipline, which is medical anthropology, cultural psychiatry, as an example, just to kind of illustrate this point, you know, like, uh, you know, like we talk about depression, anxiety, as if we, as, I mean, assuming that when we say depression, anxiety, the other person knows exactly what it is that we mean when we say anxiety or depression. I mean, as far as I know, when I talk about depression and what you understand about depression are radically different things, right? Like we all draw from our own unique world of experiences and meaning and so on and so forth. And also kind of like, you know, like the more standardized definitions of what depression is supposed to be like. When you actually talk with people who experience depression or think of themselves as, you know, having depression, like their stories are radically different. Not one person experiences depression the same. And that's true for everything else, right? Anxiety and so on. Uh, when we are working in an intercultural context, those things are even like much more detach one from another, right? That is one of the things that, for example, were very interesting for me working with Shipio people. Like in the beginning, I didn't really realize uh, that I may be saying, oh, well, you know, like at the temple we do the consultations, right? So a person comes to the Maloka and we're sitting like the facilitators, sometimes the teachers, and there's also the healers and the person kind of like shares why they are there. Like what are the things that they want help with? So oftentimes the person will be like, uh, yeah, like I've been depressed for so and so years and I've been experiencing a lot of anxiety. And then, you know, like I'm like, I, I'm gonna like translate that to the healers. And like, well, yeah, I mean, this person says that they've been depressed for many years and then been anxious and so and so. And then like, you know, like, and then like, well, do you, I mean, are we, do you understand what I'm saying, depression, anxiety? Like, what does that mean for you? And then I started realizing that the language in itself was very, very different. Like I was saying depression, but what the healers were saying back was, oh, like that person is very sad, right? Or I was saying, uh, yeah, like that person, that person has a lot of anxiety. And the healers were saying, oh, like that person has a lot of worries, right? Now there's a radical difference between a person being very sad and a person being depressed. There's a radical difference between a person being very worried or having a of worries and a person being anxious. The main difference is the medicalization of the experience, right? In the West, we tend to medicalize human experiences because it's easier to classify and so on and so forth. So we say, well, okay, so you check, I mean, your experience kind of like falls within all these checklists of diagnostic constructs that we have uh, proposed. So, you know, if you have three out of five or you have five or seven for such and such period of time, then okay, you are clinically depressed, right? So we've already pathologized an experience of a person um, in, in a certain way, right? That, that already has like a prognosis to it. Oh, okay, so you're bipolar. So, you know, I'm sorry, but your prognosis is not that great because we know statistically that bipolar people so-and-so and they have a suicide rate of so-and-so. Uh, and the only real approach that we can give you, well, we're gonna medicate you so-and-so, right? 
when you come to a shipyo person, you're like, yeah, I mean, that person has been worried for a very long time. Uh, and he's like really uh, desperate because he doesn't seem to find a way out of that worry. Like his mind is in over, like there's much more nuance and complexity in trying to describe like the actual experience of the person, bringing in the wholeness of who that person is, like his you know, peculiar history, where are they from? What is their family history like, you know? Uh, what is their work life like? Are they working in something that they love? Are they being exploited? Are they struggling to you know, pay rent? Are they very worried maybe because they're working two jobs and they don't have time to do other things and they can't even like make enough to feed their families. So these are like dimensions of affliction that Western medical establishment oftentimes ignores. It doesn't matter if you're a rich person or a poor person, a black person or a white person, it doesn't matter if you're working four jobs or three jobs and you can't make ends meet, it doesn't matter. As long as you have all of those checklists checked, then you classify as a person who is clinically depressed, right? Uh, but the, the experience of depression for different people, again, it will change radically. So in the Shipibo, in the Shipibo perception of these things, there isn't that tendency to immediately medicalized experiences. It's like, oh, like that person has a disease. They have like, you know, like a neurochemical, no, that person is sad. Let's figure out why they're sad. Let's figure out what's happening in their lives. Oh, their girlfriend left them, their family is going through different struggles. Like there's much more nuance to it, right? So that's already kind of like one thing that I really wanna unfold, like the differences between how we approach human suffering from a clinical perspective versus from a much more open community-based perspective, right? Because again, these things are crucial for treatment. When it comes to depression, this is something that has been documented over and over, you know, the differences between uh, Western societies and traditional societies, people would kind of like intuitively think, well, you know, like we have a much more advanced medical knowledge. We have a much more sophisticated theory of why people get sad. So outcomes when compared in different cultures should be much better in the West usually it's the opposite. Like usually when people make comparative studies about uh, outcomes of well-being and mental health in Western societies and non-Western cultures, non-Western cultures are much better off than Western cultures. So people have been asking like, well, why? You know, we have medicines, we have theories, we have medical institutions that like we have. How come people who live in the jungle who don't have access to medicines, who don't have access to anything, you know, like have like much, like, well, at least relatively healthier and happy lives when it comes to like these parameters of health, which are mind, like more within the mental health range, right? And one of the important things, which again goes back to like the research that I'm really interested in, one of the main things, of course, is uh, the support that those people have, you know, when you go to a Shipibo person, I mean, if you're a Shipibo, if you're a Shipibo person and you're feeling sad, right, it is very unlikely that if you go to the Onaya and they're gonna say like, oh, I'm sorry that you're feeling sad and most, something must be wrong with your brain. Uh, I'm just gonna send you a pad. We're actually going to lock you up in some faraway place and we're gonna give you this drug to regulate, you know, whatever, so you can actually not be sad. I mean, that's insane. That is unthinkable for, for, for a person living in a communal setting because what happens usually is exactly the opposite. Like, oh, like you're feeling sad. Well, first of all, let's embrace you. You know, first of all, like, you know, like let's remind you that you're part of a community. Yeah, no matter what's happening in your life, okay, we're gonna cook for you, we're gonna clean your house. If you're not able to do these things for now, it's okay. You know, like the whole community is going to engage for you, okay, assuring you that no matter what's happening your place in the community is not forsaken. And whenever you're back from that experience, you're still here, yeah? So it's a much more communal embrace that provides a much stronger support network for a person who is struggling, yeah? Which is non-existent for the most part in Western settings where a person is like ostracized because we're so afraid of mental illness. We're so afraid of madness that we'd rather institutionalize people and lock them up in um, a mental hospital than actually deal with it as a society. So it's kind of like this ongoing and increasing tendency 
to individualize affliction more and more, like more and more the tendency of the Western establishment is to say, when the individual is sick, is the individual's responsibility and the individual's fault. More so, more and more, we're not actually only responsibilizing the individual, but different parts of our bodies, more so our brains. Like, okay, you're experiencing depression, you're experiencing schizophrenia, you're experiencing anxiety, something is wrong with your brain, so we're gonna treat like this part. Okay, more and more the individual is kind of the focus of it instead of actually looking at the whole context of how that person is embedded within the community, their society, how is the family life, how is the social life, how is their laboral life. So all of these things are primary in traditional societies. Like the, the Shipio person is much more likely to start from there, to start from ensuring that you're well embedded within a functioning community, to make sure that your work is satisfactory, that whoever you're sharing life with. And then, you know, after that, then it comes like, well, let's figure out what's like in your personal experience, something that we can work with. So it's kind of like a radical difference in the way that we approach these things that I find particularly interesting, uh, particularly kind of like the different focus of like where that locus of disease is located, the individual or the network. I mean, it's not either or, obviously it's always kind of like, you know, a middle path. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot there. Um, what do you, what do you think is that balance? Because it seems like that's a, that's a big focus of your work is this idea between individual versus collective. And one of the things that, that comes to mind, I mean, I mean, much like you said, there, there's, you know, it, as the Buddha was speaking about 2000 years ago, this idea of the, the middle path and this idea that, that suffering was, was inherent to humans. Um, it seems like, I mean, even as you were talking, it seems like for a long time in, in the West, it, it was moving to this direction of individualization. But as you were talking, actually, what came up was also this idea is it seems like maybe that pendulum is shifting to the other extreme now, which is this kind of narrative that, in a sense, nothing is your fault anymore, that, that everything is somehow a collective based on your past, based on your culture, based on your skin color, based on your gender, that there is no individual responsibility anymore, that, that everything has this, this societal aspect to it. So what do you think is that balance? Because even in the, in the work you're describing in, in indigenous communities, you, you, you describe these two very unique processes, which are very different. One is the, the ceremony, which almost always is done in a communal setting. And, and as you mentioned, there's a very internal process, and yet that's set within a larger context of the community, whether that's a, in, an indigenous community, a group of Westerners who are coming and are forming a community in this very short amount of time. But that community, as you described, becomes very strong, very integral to their process. So that's the, the ceremonial aspect. And yet the other aspect you, you briefly mentioned was this idea of dieta, which is a very individual process. Uh, you know, it, it's all about isolation, <laughs> breaking the bonds of community, breaking the, the stimuli, breaking any sort of connection and, and, and you know, basically absolutely going into the individual self. So where do you, you know, as you said, obviously, the, <laughs> the answer is usually somewhere in the middle, but can you can you talk a bit about those those two processes? Because even in that indigenous worldview, those two things are, are seen to be very important. And as <clears throat> you know, I'm sure you've heard many times, even from the Shipibo, when they're talking about medicine, they would often say the medicines don't function without the dieta you know, which is what you alluded to in the beginning too, that, that it's not just the medicine. If we're talking about ayahuasca, there's all of these other things that, that are important in that context. And, and even that idea that it's not inherently just the medicine that they're prescribing to you, but the diet is very important too, the, the surroundings that, that go around that. So I know that's a bit of a generalized uh, <laughs> question, but it's interesting because both of those things are seen as very important in, in that uh, more indigenous way of looking at the world. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, these are, these are tricky things. I, I do agree with you that it seems that like that pendulum is swinging back. I mean, we did, we did experience a few decades of like a very, very heightened hyper individualism, the whole rise of like neoliberal policies and the primacy of the individual. Uh, Margaret Thatcher in the 80s saying that society is an abstraction and everything that exists is the individual. It kind of like we went like really, really, really far with that idea that we are self-contained agents in a world made of agents. And yeah, I mean, we are seeing that in the last few years, kind of like that pendulum swing back uh, in a very postmodern approach, kind of like permeating the social sciences, the humanities, something that used to be very enclosed within those worlds, kind of like just exploding out into society and permeating every aspect of our interest. I mean, I would say at least in the West, in the Euro-American centric environments, definitely, uh, you know, like this very heightened relativistic approach of postmodern strands that are very uh, prevalent. And I mean, again, like, I think both extremes are very toxic. Yeah, like when we just kind of like swerve into like hyper-individualistic solipsism, like, the only thing that matters is my internal experience and everything outside is just a projection of my own mind. I mean, that's very toxic. And on the other hand, like, oh, like we're just results of social constructions. We don't have any agency and everything that we are is inevitable because we're just hairs to all of these different social control. I mean, that's very toxic, obviously, too, because that doesn't leave us any free will. It doesn't leave us any capacity to say, okay, yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, I was shaped in such and such ways, but I still have within me, you know, that, that kernel of agency of intentionality to change myself and become something else, which I think both of the, again, like this is some both like very, uh, you know, toxic opposite. And yeah, we, we are experiencing a lot of toxicity now from the rebound of that pendulum, particularly around kind of like, you know, like this rise of identitarian, politics, like a very exacerbated uh, tribalism that is again kind of like scrambling to group people into different tribes according to where you're from or what your skin color is or what your heritage is like and so on and so forth, uh, which is very unfortunate, but it's not surprising. I think by the end of the day, again, it's like this Hegelian uh, dialectic process. I don't know if you ever like, came across this term, but like one of the main contributions of Hegel was this idea that he's thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis. So, you know, we come up with an idea, then we come up with a counter idea, and then we can like synthesize between them to kind of like find the middle path. So I think what we're experiencing culturally is something like that. Like, I'm not too concerned. I mean, it is concerning because it's very violent and very cringe worthy to sit to kind of like experience the swing of the pendulum towards like the more identitarian postmodern kind of like end of it. But at the same time, I think it's just kind of like this normal dialectical process where we're experiencing kind of like that rebound from, you know, like this is kind of like something that I think was talked about for many years that, like, oh, like we live in a patriarchal society, like white supremacy society, like, you know, that's kind of like normal for kind of like liberal people to be aligned with. And I think like once that that stopped being kind of like in the fringes of criticism and actually became a dominant ideology in society, whereas if you're not aligned with that, a lot of people are realizing, whoa, like I didn't mean it exactly like that. Like that's not exactly what I had in mind. Uh, let's take it a notch back. And yeah, I mean, there is true in this analysis, there is true in this criticism, but there's a difference between these things as analytical categories and actually implementing that as ontological realities and then enforcing some sort of morality uh, that if you don't comply with, then you're thrown out of the system, which I think is horrible. So again, I think it's kind of like this process where we're kind of, like, again, just calibrating the extremes to find another uh, center. And I think that that's kind of like a similar approach for uh, individual versus collective. I mean, this is something that has always been 
a central unresolved issue in sociology, in psychology, in anthropology. Does the individual have primacy? Does the social have primacy? Does the individual even have agency? If we assume that everything is socially constructed and culturally constructed, uh, or the opposite, like no, like there's no such thing as social construction. Everything is just individual, um, individual perceptions and individual actions, and everything else is just an illusion, right? So it's kind of like these two approaches. So again, I think like we are reaching a moment in Western thought where inevitably, inevitably I think most people are gonna start finding themselves uh, in the middle of these two things, like paying much more attention on one hand to the impact that, so that social processes have on individual well-being. Uh, that, you know, like, there's things that are evident, but not really talked about. Like if you think about culture, for example, the, 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 the impact that culture has on individual well-being, right? Like, you know, I mean, you, you, live in, you live in the US for many years, you know, like I, I live in Western, and we live in societies where consumerism is there or one of the predominant ideologies. Like the whole society is kind of like geared towards producing a very particular type of human, which is a good consumer and an obedient worker, right? Like the education system, like propaganda that we absorb, like everything is kind of like geared towards like that archetype of the person who does his work, like overworks without complaining and then spends all his money in the economy. Now, in order for that to function, there's two things that must happen. The first one is that you have to create an artificial lack of something for the person to actually want to participate in a consumerist lifestyle or it's like, you know, like a vacuum that needs to be created in the individual that then needs to be filled with something else. Those are things that usually were filled by real relationships with people, community, a sense of belonging, a sense of meaning, you know, that was kind of given by religion or nationalism, whatever, like, okay, whether it's like the flag that you care about or, you know, the cross, it doesn't matter, but there was some sense of meaning that they, I think like in secular times when that is not part of many of our experiences, like existentialism has kind of like left that vacuum, you know, that doesn't get filled with many things. So consumerism in a way appeals to that need for us to create meaning. And many times that meaning makes, well, I'm gonna find meaning in buying things and you know, consuming things and getting the new car and so on and so forth. But in order for that to happen, there is this ongoing process, again, of eroding our social connectedness because otherwise people wouldn't fall into the trap. If we have meaning in our relationships, if we have meaning in community, if we have meaning in religion and so on and so forth, we didn't have that sense. So in order for that to happen, another thing has to happen, which is we need to be bombarded thousands of times every day with subliminal messages, explicit or implicit. I mean, now it's not even subliminal, it's like in your face all the time. Like, rich American living life in a big city, uh, you get ads, uh, I think it was like on the, on the high hundreds, if not thousands of times a day. I mean, you're driving around New York City, there's like billboards, you're hearing the radio, like, Every single waking moment, there's somebody trying to influence you to participate in a consumer system. Like you need that product or you need that service, you need that to be happy. Uh, by the way, that's my definition of what sorcery means. Like that's black magic, for example. I mean, maybe we go back to sorcery and black magic later, but no society in the history deep in sorcery and black magic as we are nowadays just, you know, like that advertising marketing industry is insane. So, you know, for a person who is constantly being told you're not enough, yeah, like you're not deserve to be happy unless you buy this card or you're not deserve to, you know, consider yourself successful unless you consume this service. You know, when we're constantly being diminished of who we actually are in order to be sold things, it is very difficult for a person to have the strength of character to say, fuck that. Actually, I don't need that for my self perception. My identity is such and such regardless. No, it doesn't happen. I mean, this affects us in a very significant way, particularly when all those billboards are like white, smiling, happy people holding a glass of wine, telling you like, hey, you know, like you want to strive to be like, what? Oh. Very well 
you know, it's very marked. Like really, like if, you, if we don't live in a culture that encourages positive aspects, then it's very difficult to really be happy and healthy. You know, like the environment, which is another obvious one, well, this is kind of like a no-brainer. If you're drinking water from a polluted river, which is a reality of 90% of Amazonian people nowadays, you know, like you can't really expect to be healthy and happy. Uh, whatever that is, if you're getting like cancer or if you're just depressed because a member of your family has cancer, whatever, like if the environment is not balanced and healthy, it's very difficult to be healthy. So you kind of tracing these links between environment and individual, culture and individual, society and individual, you know, if your community is out of balance, it's very difficult for the individual to be happy. I mean, I think you and I have that exact experience during COVID because many of the pillars that held that group of people together kind of like fell apart. And when you're constantly engaged in unhealthy dynamics, then that obviously has an effect on individual self-perception. So all of these things have an impact. So I think Western society, or at least Western biological medicine, which is a very specific subset of the society, but it's nonetheless dominant. I mean, hegemonic biological medicine and biological psychiatry kind of like made it almost a point to completely ignore every non-biological, non-individual aspect. So you go to a psychiatrist in the West and very, very rarely is anybody gonna like ask you anything other than whatever they need to check. So I think, again, it's like this dialectical process. We understand that individualizing affliction, that individualizing kind of like whatever it is that we kind of like just as trying to the individual doesn't work precisely because we're missing a whole range of context. But at the same time, yeah, like just seeing the context and not seeing the individual is just as bad, if not worse, because then we're completely ignoring our greatest human gift, probably, which is like, well, yeah, I mean, actually, we're not just passive travelers in a predetermined universe, but actually, we do have a sense of agency and intentionality, and we have the capacity not only to influence our own experience, but to also change other people's experience. So, I guess. You know, like just bringing these two things into harmony and balance is a big part of this cultural process that is happening, which I hope will emerge from like this postmodern kind of like, I don't know how to call it, but like something, you know, like we have the modernism, we have like, like the postmodernism now, there's something new emergent that needs to become more prevalent that's going to synthesize both uh, of those things. You know, from, from an epistemic view, and this is one of the interesting things about working uh, in the Amazon too, right? Because how do we make sense of the experiences that we have there? You know, like most of us from Western societies, we tend to have a very particular epistemic approach, which is very rational, very sensory, like, you know, so forth. But then you come to the Amazon, you start working with the plants, you go to ayahuasca, and immediately you're kind of like thrown into a mystery that cannot be like even slightly adequately described, let alone explained, using only like enlightenment era rational logic, right? It's so like, well, how do we even speak about these things when we don't have the adequate tools or the adequate language to even start describing these things? So a lot of people go the opposite way. And they're like, well, folk science, you know, folk logic, folk rational. There's nothing that we can do, you know, to explain these things because these are like beyond language and so on and so forth. So the only other framework that makes sense is kind of like this very ethereal spirituality. Right? And say so like, well, yeah, like, you know, like you're working, these are spiritual and energy and abstract and so on and so forth. And then like, well, okay, but you know, again, like we're talking about like two very radical different ways of making sense of things that both of them are not nearly adequate to explain the complexity and the nuance of what actually we're experiencing. So how do we again, kind of like merge into a synthesis that takes whatever is useful from here, whatever is useful for here, and then we proceed forward in a more integrated way. Indigenous people are great, uh, help for us to do that because exactly 
one of the, and this is kind of like my one of my important points also is that we have so much to learn from indigenous people and indigenous cultures but that's not necessarily the things that most people think when they think about indigenous wisdom and indigenous cultures and the reason is that I think again, the same process that I went through when I first came to the jungle, where I had like a very idealized, romanticized idea of what indigenous people are like, many of us, because we're so thirsty for meaning and so attached to a particular way of interpreting phenomena, are very quick to project our own spiritual fantasies into other people and other cultures, and then interpret our experience using that framework as opposed to actually analyzing our own epistemic, you know, kind of like frameworks. We're like, well, well, maybe if I don't interpret that according to that framework, or maybe if I'm not superimposing like a spiritual new age narrative in it, actually I'll be able to see with more clarity what it is that they mean when they talk about these things. What it is that they say that they're working on, you know, in their own terms without me projecting my own kind of thing. So I think like there's a, there's a very big difference between the Amazonian medical system as it is and the Amazonian medical system as the majority of us want it to be or project it to be. And I think this is one of the most crucial, difficult things to talk about because a lot of people get very triggered when you challenge their metaphysical or epistemological assumptions, right? I mean, I, I personally as one, I have gotten into trouble already because it seems that people at the temple sometimes are displeased by my perception of what this work is about or how or what are the underlying mechanisms that bring about the results that we see and so on and so forth right so i kind of like always not always but like oftentimes i feel like okay let's just take a step back and uh examine those assumptions so we can actually talk about things seeing eye to eye and not necessarily from the place of like really being attached to a very particular spiritual projection that we're superimposing on a system that is very different from what we know. And I mean, we all do this, I do this a lot, or at least I have done this in the past a lot where I like, oh, like I don't understand how this works, but I have this idea of like, whatever, quantum mysticism or chakras or so on and so forth, like, oh, that must be it, right? So, I mean, this is a lot of nuance and complexity that I think many times gets lost because of our attachment for easy answers and easy explanatory systems that are rather unfortunate spiritual projections as opposed to an actual open-minded curiosity about how other people and other cultures perceive the very fabric of what the world is like. <laughs> It's very fascinating because I, I think for a lot of people, when when they hear that idea that kind of that you were speaking of, that we can only see things through our own lens, that, that essentially everything is fiction in a way, nothing can be purely objective, everything has a subjective aspect to it, that makes sense to people. But when it's actually in their face, it's very difficult for them to realize that because we can only see the world through our lens. and. It reminded me of a story, uh, a guy who I think you know, yeah, you, you were sitting with him, uh, Amika, a Colombian guy, and it was this very fascinating conversation about Mambe, which, which actually I have some right now, and it, two people had very different views, and they were asking him, one was coming from the view that Mambe could only be used in a ceremonial context, the other had the view that uh, it could be used outside, that you know, an individual experience was also a ceremony. It was just for that person. And they kept asking him the question and he essentially kept giving the same answer, but they kept only hearing the view that they wanted him to speak. And it was very fascinating looking at it from the outside. As an anthropologist, and, and I think it's kind of interesting, the trajectory that you took, because it, from, from what I understood, it, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like for, for a while in, in the, the, the roots of anthropology, it was this idea of a very objective science, that, that your, your role was to observe, to, to not intervene, 
to just be the, the observer who is from the subjective point, taking notes, uh, collecting data, and kind of analyzing that in a way that was not subjective. And, and then it seemed to move towards this more experiential, like if you really want to understand the culture, you, you have to get involved. And it seems like through your own process, that's kind of the, the route you took. You started more as a, this more objective point of view, analyzing, kind of looking at things from a distance, and then you began to step into that role. So what do you, what do you think? I mean, because, I mean, it's interesting. We, we keep coming back to this idea of balance, but from an anthropological point of view, where do you think is that balance between trying to remove oneself and just look at things as objectively as possible without trying to bring our views in as much versus yeah. then actually jumping in and and experiencing in the context we're talking about of like actually drinking ayahuasca or, or doing dietas taking plant medicine working with other people and being a, a, actually a part of their journey where you're not outside of that paradigm you're you're very much immersed in it yeah i mean your question reminds me of uh certain anthropologists who many years ago wrote whole books and treatises about ayahuasca without actually trying it so you know like, that's not something that, that that happens as much anymore because there's a much stronger awareness that first person experience is not just an epistemic curiosity but actually uh our primary source of of knowledge um and yeah i mean i think like that's you know like the idea that a person can be a detached observer just recording what's happening around them without actually influencing the outcome is is a fallacy you know particularly when you are embedded in a foreign setting such as you know like uh, the rainforest I mean, your mere presence there already changes radically the way that people interact with you, the, people, the way that people interact with each other. I mean, there's many themes in anthropology that have been kind of like through the ages unraveled, you know, like, I don't know, like even, even when you're interacting with people and they know that you're there because you're observing them and people will behave radically different, you know? So, I mean, the idea that you can just be there of, as a detached observer, just record. I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, the mere, the mere presence, the, the mere presence changes everything. People perform for you. People give you the answers that they think you want to hear. You know, like this is things. That, and particularly when you know when you're working with Amazonian people, who are people, you know, like whatever character attributes they have, they're they're very prone to to. Uh, people, please. That's one of the things that I found. Like, if they already know that you're looking for a particular answer, they're gonna do whatever is in power to give you that answer. You know? If you're, you're asking them to do something, they're gonna tell you yes, even if it's a no. And then you're gonna find out, like many months later, that they haven't done it. Even, you know, like they told you, or you ask for directions and they don't know. It's not like they're gonna tell you, oh, sorry, I don't know. They're just gonna send you whatever, and then you're gonna walk for miles until you realize that they actually didn't know. So it's kind of like that attribute, right? Which already changes everything. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't believe for one second that you can just be a detached observer. I think like the mere presence, like everything about that interaction already changes everything. The fact that I was there already is, uh, you know, important. So I think like the only, the only thing that you can do really is acknowledge that, hey, like this is not necessarily an objective, whatever, but is this not only the story as told by me through this particular lens, but try to be as explicit as you can about your own biases and, you know, like your own optics and your own lenses. Uh, and for me, that also includes kind of trying to map out my ideological prejudices, like my own resistances to some things. Like I'm telling this story from the perspective of me who is such and such and such and such. And I think that, again, like at least that brings a little bit more of intellectual honesty to the mix and saying like, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm trying to be a narrator of something, but also like being as honest as possible of where is this coming from? And I think that is something that is relatively new and still not very much implemented in the social sciences and humanities as a rule, 
because I think there is still a fantasy by many people. And again, like this is kind of like a process that the social sciences and the humanities have been going of trying to become legitimized by attaching themselves to the positivistic sciences as much as possible. So like, no, we can also be objective. We can also be quantitative. We can also, you know, be replete in some, I mean, but again, like, you know, like you're dealing with a completely different realm of experience, which is based on actual relationships, actual people having, you know, conversations and so on. So again, this is what I mentioned before. Like for me, one of the reasons I chose ethnography or anthropology is because it gives me that freedom to write a fiction without having to adhere to whatever pretensions of objectivity or quantifiable outcomes can be. And again, what I'm saying now, by the way, other anthropologists and other social scientists are probably the appalled and horrified but you know like i at least for myself i like to be very honest like i don't i don't think that anthropology is an exact science at all or a positivistic science is an art you know it gives you some tools to perceive engage and describe the world through a particular lens and that's pretty much it there's nothing nothing more to it it's interesting because, they, like you said, I, I would imagine many, many other anthropologists would disagree with that. S something you mentioned in the beginning, which I, I thought was very interesting, a couple of things. One was this idea of fiction that, you know, anytime one is writing, in a sense, it's fiction. And I think what you're alluding to is it is subjective. And, and so it's not an absolute reality. And also, you mentioned this idea which I think is really important that kind of you use the word ivory tower that that a lot of academia seems to be writing for and to other academics uh, and almost this you know speaking you also mentioned this idea about language and how powerful language can be and there's a very particular language that's used that's often exclusionary, I don't know if that's a word, but it excludes a lot of people. Uh, and it's almost meant to do that in a way. And it, like I was thinking, I mean, for me, if I look back in history, I, I don't think anyone would pick out non-fictional work and be like, well, that's amazing. That's like, <laughs> that stood the test of time. That's, uh, you know, that's something that's really powerful. It's almost always fiction. It's myth. It's mythos. It's these stories or even these children's stories. And, and I think something you mentioned that was very important is, and I often find it interesting, uh, I think it's I don't know about the word mistake, but it's a it's a challenge that a lot of people I see, even in facilitation face when they begin. It's something really interesting is I find they're speaking to an audience that they think understands the language they're speaking. <laughs> and it's something I've always really tried to do, which is to speak as if no one had any idea what I was talking about. And and I think much like a children's story, that's the real power of a children's story is if a child can understand it, then you're getting as close to truth as one can, uh, because truth has to be universally understood if it is truth. And, you know, we can debate what's what's true and what's not, but but good ideas have to be easily understood. Otherwise, they, they can't be understood by the masses. So where... I guess in that idea of of making things accessible, um, why do you think that's important? Because it also reminds me of, again, this idea of language and storytelling. Often in a lot of these these indigenous cultures, there's a real power of storytelling. Like often, as you said, the answers don't necessarily come in very direct ways, but they can come in forms of a story or a myth. Uh, you know, this is the the demon, or this is the the jungle spirit, or this is the 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 the, the something that's overtaken you. And to a lot of rationalistic minds, that's insane. That doesn't make any sense. And yet there's often a real power behind that because it's very visceral. It has a much different feel than if you tell people, 
you know, the difference between telling someone you're sad versus you have a demon inside you, it's very stark. <laughs> One is going to spark a lot more action than the other. So why do you, why do you, I mean, because I, I completely agree with you. I, I think that's so important, but, but where, where is that, that language and that storytelling? Because I think that's also really fascinating that you're writing a book, you're writing a story which I think is much more powerful than a paper, for example. There's something in that storytelling which is which is super powerful. I don't know if that's even a question. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is my favorite subject. You know, like in, in a big part of the analysis, like the, the storytelling dimension, the the primacy of the human imagination as an ontological. Uh, primary thing, which is something that a lot of people, again, this is one of the places where I most get into trouble uh, with people in the plant medicine circles, right? Uh, because there's a big difference between the literal and the symbolic that I oftentimes point out, right? So it is my experience, or at least my perception, that the human imagination is primary to any other external ontological phenomena. And the storytelling is the primary device through which we make sense of experiences and then construct coherent worldviews that are aligned with the experience that we have it. So first of all, yes, I mean, I'm very happy to write a story. The reason why I'm writing a story is because first of all, I never wanted an academic, I never wanted and I still don't want an academic career. So I don't have a plan to spend my life in the whole wheels of academia catering to our academics, but I wanna, you know, like I, I, I wanna be of service to people. Like that's always been my main thing. Like I'm, like I'm, not, like I'm not doing this as an advancement of my own career per se. I mean, it is obviously useful as a career move, but that's not the main motivation. The main motivation is uh, that I do think that these stories can be very valuable for other people who are looking for healing, looking for solace, looking for meaning, who for whatever reason choose uh, to explore the plant medicine path or the psychedelic path or the narrative path. So my main interest is always to cater to a wide public of people that um, they are struggling or suffering or for whatever reason just interested in the subject. This is something that also kind of came very strongly to me when I was working with people. I was like, okay, I really enjoy working with people. I love holding space, like working with a workshop. Uh, I have like nowadays that I'm not in the jungle and I'm, you know, have more space. I, I'm, I'm working with individual people one-on-one, -on -one, like doing integration, doing therapy, also with something. I enjoy that, okay. But also to some extent, like, okay, you can help one person, you can help five persons, you can help 10 persons, but also while you're doing that, like you can, I mean, I can find an avenue okay, to make something that can influence potentially hundreds or thousands or more people who can be inspired, educated, informed, and so on and so forth from that work. So it's kind of like just trying to balance out both kind of like the more direct one-on-one -on -one working with people, but also like how can I be of service in a more structural way? I mean, my approach has always been more structural than individual. I'm much like my own critical lens is more prone to look at structures rather than look at um, happenings in a sense. So yeah, I mean, the, the primacy of the story, the primacy of the human imagination, I think it's, you know, like one of the, most fascinating and important type topics that we haven't really uh, like really tapped on culturally, like how really the narratives, the discourses, the stories that we tell about what things are and what they are for thoroughly shape our experiences with them. Yeah, and this is something that, I mean, we do know that to some extent. Yeah, like we're working with ayahuasca, for example, Many, I don't know if you do that actually, I don't remember that, but many facilitators when we're doing the ayahuasca introductory talk, one of the first things that we would say was like, ask the question like, hey, who here has watched documentaries, heard podcasts, like read books of ayahuasca, and then pretty much everybody raises their hand and then would say, well, the first request that we have from you is that you forget everything that you think that you know about ayahuasca. And the sentiment that is like, okay, we all have 
already notions or ideas or preconceived, no, you know, preconceived whatever of what we expect this experience be like, yeah? And those preconceived notions can and will influence the outcome if we're not very careful to actually deconstruct that so we can have a more open uh, experience and experience the mystery in itself without being, you know, like already uh, kind of like prime to interpret that in a certain way. And this is something that happens all the time. I have uh, one of my clients that I've been seeing uh, for integration for, for, for the last year. Uh, she first did ayahuasca with one of the Brazilian uh, tribes, a well-known Brazilian indigenous leader. And I don't, I don't know what happened at ceremony, but after I shared like a very strong experience and then the facilitator who was in that uh, ceremony or workshop for whatever reason told her that she was possessed by a demon, okay? Exactly what you said before. Uh, and since she became convinced that she was possessed by a demon, regardless of what the ontological, metaphysical reality of demons are or aren't and so on and so forth, telling a white person that she's possessed by a demon and then just leaving it, I mean, that's not growth facilitation under any conceivable parameter, right? But, you know, like that person didn't act in bad faith. They thought like, well, you know, the shaman said they have a demon, so I might as well just communicate that to the person. Hey, like, by the way, like this guy said we have a demon. Uh, but then, you know, like you leave that person like, well, what the fuck do I do? I mean, do I have a demon? Like, what does that even mean? And, you know, how is that? And that experience was very influential. I mean, that person was affected by a, de by a demon because she bought into the story that, oh, like if the shaman says that I have a demon, then I must have a demon. And then like, you know, for, 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 for a long period of time, like her daily, daily experience was massively affected by the idea or the belief that there was an actual spirit possession and the demon was kind of like dictating her behavior and so on and so forth. I mean, these things are extremely tricky. This is where like cultural translation comes into play and an understanding of context comes into play. Saying like, well, literal understandings of things are not necessarily the best idea when you're acting within like radically different ontological assumptions or like radically different worldview assumptions what a demon means for them i mean starting from the language right? i mean first of all like you know like they say demon i mean first of all they probably used some pano amazonian word which very loosely translates to anything resembling what we understand to be demon based on our own kind of like world of meaning that draws from like Judeo-Christian traditions. And then like we have this idea, okay, for them, a demon might be something radically different that it might be for somebody from our background. So already like that's a failure of translation. Um, so, you know, like you have to deal now with a person who for whatever reason got convinced that she's possessed with a demon. Uh, you know, then it all comes back to that story. You know, like the language, like the linguistic virus of an idea that gets lodged in a person's belief system can be incredibly difficult to excise afterwards. When a person like really becomes attached to that idea, to that belief, to that thought, to that linguistic model, you know, like, well, you know, have you ever considered that maybe that's not a metaphysical reality, but just an idea or a story that you have absorbed as part of your identity? And that can be incredibly difficult to work with. I mean, I'm sure you have had like endless examples of these things. I mean, I sure have endless examples all these things on how ideas or beliefs can like really manifest as, as actual afflictions, diseases, like anxieties and so on and so forth. So, you know, I, again, like there's like this very, I don't know how, I don't know how to put this in a way that is constructive, but I think like within the plant medicine circles, within the psychedelic communities in a very general sense, there is still a very juvenile attachment to literal interpretations that I find discouraging. And then when challenged oftentimes elicit a lot of, uh, not only resistance, but almost indignation. Like how dare you suggest that actually uh, this is like 
just the person's imagination and not an actual demon or not an actual spirit or how dare you suggest that there's like more complexity complexity and intricacy to a situation that just like oh like that person you know whatever so you know and again like we go back to like that which you were mentioning earlier about dieting right like dieting is you know, a unique epistemic avenue in the sense that it's 100% based on subjective experience. Like, you know, a person can diet a plant and, you know, have an experience with that plant or imagine that they have an experience with that plant or be 100% uh, sure that the actual spirit of the plant told them so-and-so or that they heard the melody for a particular ikaro that they ascribe to like being given it to the plant. I mean, there can be like an endless array of like different interpretations of what happens in the diet. And very rarely, almost impossibly, that two persons are gonna die the same plant and they're gonna come up with like the same conclusions about like who that plant is or what the plant is about. I mean, my personal experience is even within Shipibo healers, even within people from the same family or the same lineage, I have found very little consensus about anything, pretty much. Like the ideas of like what that plant is good for, or what the diet is good. I mean, there's some things that are pretty standard, yes, but when you get to like the details of it or like the micro resolution of what their personal beliefs or personal experience are like, things diverge widely between people and people. So you're gonna get, okay, there, is there some objectivity in it that if everybody dies the same plant, they might tap into the same source of wisdom or they, meet, they, they might meet like the same, you know, source of intelligence. They might receive like a similar thing. Okay, maybe there's something objective, okay? but also it is true that the stories that we tell about those things are incredibly influential. And now what's happening, for example, I mean, if this is something that I did as, as part of the research, like you start seeing like how plant diets are being advertised in like recent years you know like uh even shipibo own shipibo run diet centers but also like western diet centers and pr pr pretty much what we what what has been happening in the last few years is that we are creating another taxonomy another botany of plant spirits so you know like now people can like have a general idea well if you wanna you know like if you wanna diet bobinsana then bobinsana is very good for uh you know like grounding you it's very warmy so it's gonna bring you a lot of light and a lot of love it's very good for processing heartbreak uh if you wanna gain clarity and solidity then you better diet tobacco because tobacco is a plant that will give you like that kind of wisdom if you wanna diet uh chirik sanango then you're gonna uh, get like a lot of strength of character and you're gonna get like a lot of discernment and you know that's gonna and Whatever, like there's like now like we have created kind of like this botany of different as if as if we're like engaging in a in a classification of what the different spirits teach or what the different spirits are for or what like the different physical elements or mental elements or spiritual elements and so on and so forth. Uh, but you know, like often again, like we're oftentimes ignoring the linguistic dimension of it. That once you tell a person what that plant is supposed to be for. Or once you tell a person like what that person says about like dieting, you're already priming that person towards a particular interpretation of a very particular frame. There's something really interesting, for example, that I noticed during the interviews. Uh, I would I would like interview people after their their workshops. So I started noticing that I could more or less uh, guess who the facilitator was for that workshop based on how people were describing their experiences, right? Like people were describing their experiences, talking about grandmother ayahuasca as a she, uh, as a benevolent plant spirit that was, you know, very feminine and there was like particular language marks that I knew, oh yeah, like you got the ayahuasca talk from that person, right? Uh, I mean, one of the most salient ones, uh, I don't know if you remember, but a few years ago, we had a teacher who was very trauma informed and a lot of the work that she brought was very based on like her own trauma training uh, and interviewing people. I found out like that pretty much every person in that workshop had 
discovered an instance of childhood sexual abuse. And I was like, holy fuck, like this is uncanny. You know, like how come like that many people have expressed or discovered sexual abuse? I mean, there must be that either sexual abuse is much more prevalent than we thought within a certain Euro-American upper middle class like demographic, or there's something in the narrative that they were given that is priming them towards focusing on a self-analysis based on trying to uncover sexual trauma, right? I think it was the second one. I think that particular workshop, the narrative that the teachers were passing on was very much based. I mean, this is a very tricky thing because on one hand, well, yeah, I mean, sexual abuse is a big thing and sexual and childhood sexual abuse, it is actually more prevalent than most people realize, particularly amongst North American uh, populations, but at the same time, right? Like one of the, let's say controversial, I mean, it's no longer very controversial, but there was, there used to be like a very controversial topic within psychology, which was this idea of uh, therapies that were geared towards recovered memories. So, you know, it's hypnosis, there's different techniques that were designed or devised towards allowing people to access what they thought were repressed childhood memories that because of the traumatic nature of the experience have been pushed down into like a very deep shadow, right? Um, you know, but when people started like really looking into it, they were like, well, actually, you know, like the majority of these recovered memories are sketchy at best, yeah? And then when people started like doing a little bit more research, they realized, well, actually the majority of what people think of recovered memories are actually just confabulations or, you know, projections or for whatever reason, like maybe some content in it that can be interpreted in a symbolic way, but not in a literal way, right? And what started happening also is that a lot of parents started getting accused of like molesting the children, like, hey, like I never did that. You know, so it started becoming really, really dangerous for other people because people were kind of like coming up with these like recovered memories and may or may not have, have happened, but that have like a very real, you know, damaging impact in real life for other people. So it became kind of like a big thing in psychology to kind of like start, start to realize like, wait, are these therapies that are focused on recovering repressed memories actually beneficial or not? So, you know, I think with ayahuasca, one of the things is that we have approached, I mean, we have adopted a very, very psychologizing attitude towards it where we, we say doing the work, what we actually mean is like doing the self-analysis introspective kind of like psychological part of the work. Oftentimes, like, in, in, I mean, not, not, not oftentimes, but many facilitators or many teachers uh, would guide the participants into framing things as, hey, like, you know, your anxiety, your depression, whatever is happening, whatever dysfunction you have as an adult must 100% how it's deep roots into something that happened to you in childhood, which I find to be unfortunate. Yeah, I think, again, like generalizing or providing easy explanatory systems or overarching explanatory systems for human suffering is very tricky because we've been doing that all along. And in many ways, we're doing that again. Yeah, now with ayahuasca and psychedelics in general, saying like, okay, whatever adult dysfunction you have, let's dig into the deeper roots of your childhood because we're going to find the trauma there that will explain everything that happened after. This might be true for some people. My experience is that's not true for most people. Yeah. So again, like this is kind of like Abraham Maslow's famous law of the instrument. If your only tool is a hammer, everything is going to start looking as a nail. So I think we do think a lot of people as nails, depending on what hammer we're holding in our hand, which I found to be counterproductive. And this is something that kind of like comes to life through talking to people. Like, you know, like this is like the, the narratives of the person after the experience. And I mean, this is not necessarily bad. Like people, it's not like, you know, they fail because they didn't get to the root of the trauma, but like, hey, well, maybe, you know, your dysfunction is not necessarily rooted in whatever, story you made about your mom not holding you enough when you were a child but maybe there's other things you know maybe you're just bored with your job or maybe you're just you know whatever there's a thousand different existential issues that are not necessarily 
rooted in a very psychologized notion of like the human individual as a product of trauma. I think we're a little bit overdoing it with the trauma approach. That's kind of like my personal perspective. Uh, and I say this, by the way, I'm, I'm about to, to finish my training with Gabermate, which has been amazing. I really appreciate Gabermate and the compassionate inquiry approach. I found it extremely useful. I'm happy to use that with clients when it's appropriate, but also I do have a lot of questions about you know, many of the assumptions. So it's just, that's just one example of how uh, what actually happened narrative or a very particular interpretive framework and we don't really see beyond that and again like this is kind of like you know if there's two things that are the common running thread of everything that we that we've been speaking about is precisely that i think we are losing by the day the capacity to hold complexity and nuance and paradox and uncertainty and if anything is useful from psychedelics and ayahuasca and all this thing is precisely the awareness that things are mysterious and that uncertainty is a intrinsic fact of life. And that if we're constantly looking to explain things away, we're just gonna be either one, deluded ourselves, deluding others or falling into cognitive traps. So, you know, like that capacity to really dwell into the uncertainty and saying like i don't know you know like that epistemic humility of saying okay i'm faced with inscrutable complex phenomena which i participate in i find them helpful but i don't necessarily know how to explain them and communicate that in a way that is neutral and not predisposing people to interpret those things in a deep, in a certain way i mean i think this is kind of the most complex but ultimately most necessary things that facilitators and therapists and everybody engaged in this kind of work has to like really absorb like hey how can i stay how can i stay open to the fact that there's a mystery out there that can be helpful that can be beneficial that i can dwell into that i can try and conceptualize in different ways but without necessarily getting attached to an ontological this is how things are. And if you don't agree with me, then you just don't get it. Yeah, this is what I've been told many times. Like, oh, you just don't get it yet because you haven't dieted enough. Like, well, I mean, I may diet more. I may diet 20 times. You know, that doesn't mean that one day I'm going to start using the same language that you do to describe the experience that you have because it's just different frameworks in which these things can be approached and be just as meaningful for people, right? Like, I think like, the standard has to be not what you think is true, but what is ultimately beneficial and helpful for the person in front of you. And that requires a lot of cognitive flexibility and ideological flexibility. Oh, you're a spiritual person, you know, like that language of plant spirits and like ascension and awakening speaks to your heart. Great, that's great. You know, like that is a good sense making device for you to make sense of the experience. But that's not going to work for another person who might be more secular or more rational minded or more existential you know whatever so i think that, that's kind of like the thing where i would like to see more people engaging with more epistemic humility and more intellectual honesty in being much more careful not to pass down our linguistic viruses and ideological frameworks to other people particularly people who are new to this work and who might or might not resonate with that work um, you know, but, so we don't have a lot of other people freaking out about being possessed by a demon or, you know, people being freaked out about eating papaya when they're not supposed to eat papaya and then thinking that they're broken for life. I mean, these are things that happen. I mean, I'm not saying that the diet restrictions are useless. I think they have, you know, a rationale and a logic behind them. It's just how we present those things. I think that's kind of the crucial thing. This, you know, the storytelling aspect of it. Mm. Yeah, great. <clears throat> I think those things are all su super, super important. And that, 
that idea of how we set things up is, is, is vital. And it actually takes a lot of wisdom and humility, which, you know, I think for anyone in this work is something that actually takes a long time to cultivate because it is, it, it's very difficult for people to kind of get out of the way. It's, you know, as you're talking about kind of this Western mindset, it's, you know, kind of some of these ideas or people you were alluding to, it's very easy that we all want to put our mark on, on life, on, on the work. And this is, you know, this is how it's done. This is how I see it. This is my version of it. And it's, it's very difficult. And it, it you know, again, it takes a lot of humility to, to, to step away from that and, and to, to truly do what's best for the person. You mentioned this idea of um, you came down like almost everyone with all of these ideas, these kind of new agey ideas about what this work is, who who these people are. Can you speak a little bit about that, and you know maybe what some of those ideas were, and and how that changed? Because you used a really interesting word, which was reality, <laughs> uh, which again is a word as as you were mentioning, kind of in this more postmodern way of looking at the world, it's something that a lot of people have resistance to. And yet from my experience, and, and I think what you were alluding to is for a lot of these indigenous practitioners, they're very rooted in reality. And, and that's a, a very big part of their work and their wisdom is, is they, they, there's certain things that they don't question because from their own experience of working on themselves and, and many people, they've come to see a certain degree of reality. And, and that's very grounding and it's very base in a way of like, there's not a lot of fluff or a lot of these kind of new agey spiritual ideas. It's just very real, it's very, uh confrontational in a way but but only because that's when it confrontational in the way that when that when something is said that's so basic and so real it, it can shake our reality when we have all of these other ideas so can you speak a little bit about that because i think that's something really important that i've also very much experienced is you know the i think the people that i've worked with who do this work best they're they're very real in a way. They're they're not that idealized version of of what many people may think uh, this work or these people are about. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think you know like the most immediate example of it is the difference between what like vegetalismo is or what it is in its context and what many people think vegetalismo is when it is transported and translated from an actual social Amazonian setting into working with Westerners. I mean, the first thing that happens right off the bat is that we completely cripple the whole system by taking only half of it. Yeah, we only want the healing. We don't want the sorcery. We don't want the black magic. We don't want to acknowledge that the whole metaphysical explanatory system of how this work means is inherently violent yeah so this is something that many people don't really realize but and this is something that i think gets sanitized quite a lot when we translate that work into new age terminology like oh like a person is just cleaning your aura or it's just like cleaning your energetic body um, you know like this lodging energetic notes that you have with like the, okay yes and yeah for an indigenous person that is doing that work, um, they're working within an ontological framework that is very different from ours. Yeah, like, I mean, again, like maybe this requires a little bit of a, just kind of like a, a step back. Okay, so, so, so the ontology of the Western world, which I mean, the ontology is just kind of like a fancy world that means what the world is made of, whether, how do we perceive reality to be and made of, and how do we approach like that reality? And again, yeah, like you said, Reality is a tricky word. I am short from making a commitment to objectivity, but yes, I mean, there's something out there which is experienceable by everybody, even if through different lenses, but it, that it exists or is uh, accessible to everybody, regardless of who you are. I mean, that's kind of like one of the definitions of reality. Yeah, like it is there for everybody to experience, 
if you have access to it. Um, in the world, I mean, in the West, we obviously live in a materialistic world where the primary thing is matter, everything is atoms, and the only causality that we could conceive of for how things happen is cause and effect within this kind of like uh, Newtonian causality of like something hits something, that something has a velocity and a direction, so and so forth. So it's kind of like a very mechanic. It's a clockwork universe, yeah? Nothing happens without it being affected by something else, and that something else has to be some material thing with volume and so on and so forth. So it's matter. Uh, so in that's, that's how we address disease, right? Like, you know, like there's something wrong with the body, then we look, you know, with a telescope or we do blood. Test. We try to locate within the body, where is that foreign thing that is creating that? Where is it in the material reality of my body, that which is creating that affliction? When it comes to mental disease, then well, where is that genetic flaw or where is that like imbalance of neurotransmitter? Well, there's always kind of like a kind of like mechanical clockwork aspect to it. Um, many traditional people, including Amazonian people, don't experience the world according to Western ideas, obviously, okay? And they experience the world not necessarily from a materialistic perspective, but from a very different non-materialistic non perspective in the sense that the primary aspect of their world is not necessarily the physical aspect of it, but the essence behind the physical. So we in the West tend to see the world as a collection of objects that are inert, that are just there in order to serve as artifacts to be exploited and used by human communities. So the world is basically a massive depository of inert matter to be shaped and molded for our needs. And more and more, that also includes the rest of our community of sentient beings, which is the animals, which more and more in industrialized times also kind of like turn into problems. Yeah, I mean, you know, you get a steak on your table, very few people are even aware of the whole process that turned a sentient, beautiful, smart cow into a commodity that was sold in the supermarket. All of these things are oftentimes kind of like a clue. So even animals and plants in many ways in our modern disenchanted secular view uh, tend to just be objects to be used for humans. Obviously, in animistic worldviews, particularly Amazonian worldviews, this is not the case. Yeah, like the primary aspect which binds everything together is not that everything is made of atoms, but that everything is spirit. That everything has the same qualities that we ascribe to us as humans. Yeah, like that capacity to feel sensations, perceive emotions, think thoughts act upon those thoughts and be agents in the world, uh, influence other people, hold grudges, you know, be angry. Like all of the things that we oftentimes think as uniquely human, in Amazonian worldviews, those things are ascribed to everything. Plants, trees, the river, the rain, even rocks, okay? Like everything has that sentient quality which binds everything into a, we are all one kind of like, saying, but not like the we're all one uh, of like, you know, hippie raver festival, like, oh, like, you know, we're on MDMA, so I have empathy, so we're all one. No, this is like, this is a we're all one in the most deeply radical sense of everything comes from the same source and is made of the same essence, and that essence is sentient, and that essence is not only sentient, but it's communicative, and is active, and it has effects, on you know the world and so on and so forth. So you know, so when 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 we go to the jungle uh, and we encounter kind of like that worldview, it's very very difficult to really make sense of what that means. You know, well, well yeah, I mean you know like just drinking ayahuasca, ayahuasca. You know, well they say that it's it's a spirit. They say that it's a plant. But what does that really mean? you know, within my disenchanted frame, well, I'm just going to interpret according to what I know, which is like, well, just like a symbolic metaphor, right? For, so that, 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 that's kind of like one, one approach. Like, oh yeah, I mean, they talk about spirits, they talk about entities, they talk about whatever, but that's just a symbolic way of saying things that are, um, you know, 
the other way is like, oh yeah, like that's to totally like literal. They're talking about like ayahuasca having a spirit. I've seen that spirit. It looks such and such. It told me so and so. Uh, that spirit has such features and such qualities and like that part of the four. It's kind of like that kind of more literal sense. So, you know, we're going back to kind of like that explication of sorcery from, from the medical systems. Um, you know, as far as I understand, and again, this is kind of like my understanding so far of how vegetalism works, or at least how it used to work traditionally when people were still embedded within a more traditional setup, is that healing always happens simultaneously with fighting. Because in the Amazonian worldview, illnesses never happen in a vacuum. As part of like this animistic ontology where the world is always a community of subjects who are sentient, when a person gets ill, it's never just because that person got ill out of nowhere, but the etiology of disease is always relational. Like people get sick because they were made sick by someone. And that someone can be a sorcerer, that somebody can be another human, that someone can be a plant which they disrespect, uh, that someone can be whatever, but it's always someone, like someone, like a person who can be human and can be non-human. But sickness always happen relationally, yeah? Like we infringed in some rule of reciprocity, we infringed in some rule of harmony, we uh, hunted somebody who we shouldn't have hunted, or we hunted too many, of some people we shouldn't hunt it, or we were fishing somewhere we weren't supposed to fish, or we took too many fruits from somewhere that we weren't allowed to take fruits. Like there's always like very strict rules of reciprocity that also encode within them a very, very sophisticated eco-social worldview, right? In which humans are just one aspect of a much wider ecosystem of sentience, which is always predicated on uh, maintaining the harmony and the balance between the human community and the non-human community, right? So and this is something that actually I have talked with many healers and they say, they always tell me like, oh yeah, I mean, whenever we work with Western people, that's easy for us. It's much, much harder for us to work with Shipibo people, like, you know, like, like healing a Shipibo person is fucking difficult. Healing a white person, it's fine. We're just singing, clearing up things, whatever. Like, well, why? What's the difference? Like, like, well, because in your world, yeah, like you just have like blockages, you have like these things, but in our world, I know that if a person comes feeling ill, then uh, somebody is making them ill. And if I wanna heal that person, then I first have to fight and defeat that other person who is making that person ill. So it's not just like me singing and like wishing that person well and like living energies, it's me like literally engaged in a soul sorcery defeating the source of that person's illness. And again, like this can be understood in a whole range of different levels from the most symbolic to the most literal, right? But the point is, you know, it's something that's very difficult for people to grasp, like Amazonian shamanism, even when it comes to healing in essence, or at least as understood within the native framework is always violent because it's always this act of healing. You know, like people come from a new age sensibility, they're like, oh, like, no, we don't care about like fighting. We don't want anybody to fight. We just want to heal. Like, we just want to, you know, like get better. We want to get these blockages. And, you know, like, well, yeah, but we need to first figure out what it is that is making you ill. Yeah. And sometimes that requires so and so. So, first of all, like when we translate like Amazonian ontologies and their medical systems to a Western audience, we're already almost inherently kind of like just taking half of it. Yeah, like brujo, bad, sorcerer, bad, healer, good. Okay, we just stay with the healers and we stay with this thing. So, I, don't, I forget like where were we going with this uh, distinction, but I think it was like the differences between. Um, well, like, the, yeah. the the idea about like the um, the preconceived ideas that 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 you or many people come down with about this right. work and about the healers and and how uh, you know eventually those begin to fade away into something that's much more real and concrete. Yeah, I mean, I think like one of the first things that people realize in the Amazon is that whatever fantasy we came off of, like love and light and rainbows and unicorns, uh, is nonsense, and that the actual reality of 
like the actual lived realities of people in the Amazon, both in like daily life and labor life, but also like in shamanic life are incredibly dark and ambiguous. And there's always like this very, you know, like shady, sketchy kind of like realm of like, no, I mean, nobody is fully benevolent and fully good and nobody is fully like malevolent and fully bad. And like shamans nowadays kind of like, you know, like have that need to detach themselves from that ambiguity because they want to cater to Westerners. They're like, well, oh, no, I only heal. I'm only here to heal you. I'm not a sorcerer. Like I'm not gonna be doing any sorcery. So, you know, but that's kind of like a marketing device or a transfiguration of the essence of what I was in the is just catering to like whatever either new age or liberal sensitivities they're catering to. You know, if you're really engaging with Amazonian systems in their own terms, like that capacity to hold the fact that people are complex creatures and that all of us have like really dark sides and that all of us are capable of both like the most wonderful, beautiful things, but also like the darkest atrocities. I mean, those are truths that are very uncomfortable for people to come with, you know, like, it's like, like even just like coming to terms with the fact that like, the person that you're entrusting yourself to as your teacher, as your healer, as the person that you want to work with, yeah, I mean, he's a human being and he has done a lot of fucked up shit in their lives and they may not be the most amazing husbands to their wives and they, you know, may beat their family. And that doesn't necessarily make them bad healers or, you know, like bad onayas or bad tabakers or anything. It just makes them complex human beings. And again, like this comes back to like that thing that I was saying before, like how, you know, like we're losing so much of our capacity to hold complexity and nuance and humanize people. And I think like that's, if there's one thing that I would like to see more as a result of all of this work, is just like more relentless humanizing of each other. Like, you know, like not idealizing, not fantasizing over what like that person should be like, but like, hey, like, yeah, like we're all here, we're all humans, we're all fallible, we all, we all done fucked up stuff, we all did things that we're not proud of. That doesn't make us inherently good or bad, it just makes us human. So like, how do we move from here into bringing like that reality into the healing world? So first of all, we're managing people's expectations. So when shit happens, they're not like, oh, I can't fucking believe it. Like that person wasn't like that whole idea of love and light that I expect them to be because they're not gonna be that the shit is gonna happen. So it's already like, managing expectations, but also being more like in real and process, which is not necessarily like, again, like unicorns and rainbows, but like, hey, like you wanna heal, you wanna grow as a person, you also need to kind of come to terms with, you know, the fact that you are human. And as every human, you're, we're fallible and everybody is, is fallible as too. So I think like that's kind of like a big part of that reckoning process of like letting go. Like, I think like, you know, like a big part of that is precisely that we come to plant medicine, we come to psychedelics from a path that has been open through like all of these different new age ideas that a lot of people still have an attachment to this idealized idea of a guru or, you know, like the Indian sage who lives in a cave and is all radiating wisdom and you just sit at his feet and then he tells you what your life purpose is and how to get enlightened and so on. And, you know, when we're dealing with Amazonian shamans, for example, you know, some people are still kind of sort of expecting that archetype of like the very wise person who can see through, you know, their deceits and can see through their energetic body and like tell them things that they themselves don't even know. And like, you know, projecting that idea and then getting really disappointed when they find out, oh, actually this is not an enlightened person. This is not even necessarily, um, you know, like a benevolent person in the sense that I expected. So, you know, he must be like, I can't, I can't do this anymore or whatever. So I think, you know, like this, that, 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 that sense of like how, again, like how we very much project our spiritual fantasies over and over and over in many, many different ways, including what we expect from the person that we're working with. Uh, including what we expect from not only the person, but like the culture and like what else, like the underlying metaphysical substrate of that work and, you know, so on and so forth. So, I mean, at least for me, like a lot of that was like that record. It's like, holy fuck, like, 
I don't know what I think about sorcery, for example. I have had experiences during ceremonies and during diets where I was like scared, like the fuck out of my life, like things that I never even thought. Like, you know, like some of the most horrifying, terrifying moments of my life, you know, happened during diets and so on and so forth. And like, I thought I was going to die. I thought like the plant was going to kill me. Like, you know, like images of like darkness. Is, all of those things happen and in real life they feel so real and they feel so true and they feel so so salient that you know i can see why people are very really quick to say like oh you know like those experiences are the real experiences because they happen within that space of like the diet the psychedelia and so on and so forth so, so it's very kind of like easy to say well you know like i 100 percent believe the story that what happened during the ceremony must be interpreted during you know through this framework because i experienced it myself and it was scary as fuck but then you know at least for me what usually happens is that after a few days or after a week or so i kind of like, you know things integrate and i start thinking about that experience again and i kind of like bring that back up again and i relieve that experience and i'm like huh you know yeah i mean that was scary as fuck but you know like maybe there were other aspects of play maybe it wasn't as much that there was an actual spirit from a plant that was killing me because i hadn't followed my diet the way that i was expected to but actually maybe you know like the knowledge that i wasn't following with my diet pre-created in me that fear you know that manifested that experience i mean there's so many different possibilities of why we experience the things that we experience without necessarily having to default to spiritual or metaphysical explanation. And I'm not saying that those are not true. They may be true, you know, that it may be that the ultimate reality of everything is exactly as that. You know, like malevolent forest spirits that want to fuck you up and like benevolent tree spirits that want to protect you and all of this kind of like social drama of disembodied, whatever, it may be that that's true. So I'm like, you know, for me, it is important to not immediately default to that, but also consider kind of like, these long strains of epistemic biases and cognitive biases, why does that experience manifest in the way that it did? And I think that's kind of like the crucial aspect also from a facilitator is like not necessarily validating immediately the interpretation of the person saying like, oh yeah, mm, you didn't diet the way you were supposed to, so the spirit of the plant is punishing you, which I have heard many times, but rather, oh, that's an interesting experience. What do you think? that could have been about, you know? And then allowing the person, I mean, for me, that would have been like, you know, whoa, you know, I, I, I wasn't like 100% following through with the exact restrictions. And even though I wasn't like very, I, I wasn't like very convinced about them. I was still feeling very guilty about it. And with a lot of shame, oh, like, you know, just follow the restrictions, they're not very difficult. Why can't I just play along and even if I don't really feel, you know, so it's already kind of like this story that I'm creating about like me not following restrictions and like being of like, you know, oh, well, maybe when I do drink ayahuasca, then, uh, you know, fuck around and find out. Maybe I'm going to find out. Maybe, you know, I'm going to learn to my own skin why these things are important and the plant spirit is going to punish me. You know, so it's already kind of like this narrative layer of linguistic priming that is overlying that. So, you know, there's just many layers of complexity and nuance that I think are very difficult, that are very important to always, you know, help each other unravel as opposed to just offering easy explanatory systems for a person to make sense of that experience according to that. Which I think, you know, that's eventually like the, the goal, should be the goal of everybody, particularly in this work, is not telling people how to think, but um you know showing people i mean not, not not telling people what to think or how to interpret their experiences but presenting them different frameworks and allowing them you know to try out like different meaning making devices to find the one through which they can create meaning according to their own worldview for that to be the most helpful for their own path that's i mean that's my particular feeling about it you, you mentioned in the beginning and without getting too political, but you had said that when you came down, like many people, you, you had this very political view, much more left-leaning, progressive. And I find that's something that's very common. And for whatever reasons, whether that's many people are coming down or coming from cities, which tend to lead that way, 
Um, but it's something I find very fascinating because much as you were saying, kind of shedding away these more new agey ideas into something that's more real and more grounded, I find that's a really interesting thing that often happens even in people's kind of political evolution is there seems to be a falling away of some of these ideas. And I find, especially during this time, we, we alluded to it a, a little bit, but it seems like there's such this focus on identity and that, that, that you know, all of these layers are what shape us. And that, as you said, it seems like there's this lack of complexity of nuance. And something that I see from people who actually tend to end up doing this work for a prolonged period of time is there's a shifting of that worldview. And because a lot of that worldview, however we want to refer to it, you know, like super progressive or leftist, it seems like there's very much this sense of like, I know. It's coming from that same like, I know mind of like, this is how the world is. This is how it should be. This is how everyone needs to think. And, and I think we see a lot of that in culture of, if you don't agree with me, we go after you, we label you. And it, you know, it's something that I find very interesting because it seems to me one of these pillars, as you were mentioning of this plant work, is this idea of complexity, of nuance, that even from a more medical point of view, this idea of neurogenesis, neuroplasticity, like it's, it's making us look at things in a very different way. And often that's very alarming to people. And I think in a way, if people only do this work for a short amount of time, it's, it's easy to kind of bypass that. Like maybe we have an experience, but it's very easy to go back to old patterns. But if we continue to do it, these things, we're, we're kind of faced with them in a way. Like much, as you mentioned in diet, it's like these things are in your face and you're just looking at them. Uh, there's nowhere else kind of literally and metaphorically to run towards do you think that's one of the, the, the powers of, of, of these plant medicines is that that idea of like neurogenesis, neuroplasticity, and it is in a way forcing us to kind of shed these worldviews, which we seem to be very attached to. And one of the ideas you were speaking about was this deep suffering that a lot of people are experiencing and, and you know, very much Western medicine. And, and I think most people would agree is, is an amazing system. Uh, you know, if, if, if my leg broke or I was bleeding profusely, for sure, I would want to go to a hospital and, and have that fixed. But you're speaking more of these ideas of mental, emotional conditions, things like depression, anxiety, loneliness, a, a feeling of a lack of purpose, lack of community. And it seems like, paradoxically, a lot of these worldviews, while they seem to, to, be trying to get to the to the root or to solve those actually in the end end up deepening those deeply ingrained systems. Um, so I know this is kind of a long question, but do you see, because you mentioned you saw that in yourself, do you think that's just a natural evolution of, of, of what someone begins to experience when they work with these plants is like we're forced to come to terms with these beliefs, which you know, again, this could be argued in different ways, but some people would say any of those beliefs that we hold on to very strongly inevitably will cause us suffering. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and again, this is another one of those points where I'm often in conflict ideologically with other people. Uh, I personally don't think that plants do anything inherently. Uh, or psychedelics, as if like, oh, like LSD does such and such, or like ayahuasca does such and such. There's a lot of research that has been coming up lately, which is focused on kind of like this parameter, oh, like, you know, like uh, working with psychedelics inherently promotes nature connectedness or inherently pro promotes like, there's, there's been like a research that was like written about like ayahuasca, uh, I don't remember which psychedelic was, but, but like this psychedelic inherently promotes like liberal values or liberal beliefs. And I was like, no, I mean, you know, like, I think after the first wave of fascination with psychedelics wears out, people are gonna start realizing, well, actually, again, like psychedelics are neutral in many ways. Yeah, like, it's, it's, I think like plants are similar, like they're neutral. They don't have like an agenda per se, as people imagine them to have, but rather like a, like a, crucial component 
of what these plants are for, or how we use them, or how we benefit from them, has to do precisely with the stories that we tell about what those plants are for and how do we use them and so on and so forth. So, you know, I mean, if you are embedded within a system that is promoting a particular narrative or a particular discourse, then people are gonna have those experiences. And maybe, uh, you know, like, Maybe that's not ex entirely true. There may be things that some psychedelics or some plants do actually have like an innate potential to bring out from a person. I do think there's a big difference, for example, between obviously LSD and ayahuasca and you know psilocybin or, or ketamine. I mean, I don't have a preference or a favorite. I think all of them are great tools for different things, depending what the person is. But I do think that, you know, like each one of these things does have maybe uh, more of a propensity to bring out or to or conduce to certain experiences. Um, I think from my experience, ayahuasca and mushrooms to some extent are very prone to show um, maybe aspects of who we are that are not true. Or, you know, like people call it shadow work in a very broad sense. So, you know, again, like I, I, I don't know whether that propensity is because really that's what they do or because we have such a strong cultural story about what psychedelics are for and like, you know, like the therapeutic way of like, you know, like you must use these things therapeutically and you must use them to uncover your shadow and integrate like they don't know. I don't know which one of them, maybe it's a combination of both, but I do think at least in my experience, ayahuasca helped me a lot precisely to see like the blind spots, um, both in my personality, but also, you know, in my character and also in my thought. And, you know, like more to your point when it comes to politics, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, am, a, I am a urban person. I grew up in cities a lot of my life. I come from a strong, you know, kind of like leftist liberal background, you know, like my natural inclination obviously has been towards that kind of like part of the spectrum. Uh, in my academic orientation, I also come from a very critical perspective that is very rooted in a Marxist analysis. Not necessarily like in terms of, you know, just like, like in terms of like the Marxist critique of capitalism and kind of like a more of a Marxist view of power in general and so on and so forth. So I do have that, but I, I like it. I mean, it's not something that I reject or anything. I think it has a lot of value, but you know, again, like as oftentimes happens, I think we tend to become blind to ideology. And because we were indoctrinated in a certain line of thought, it can be Marxism, it can be neoliberalism, it can be like today, you know, like the idea of like identitarian ideas. Um, and oftentimes what happens is that we become very attached to that and we tend to assume that that is the only way that is good or true for the world and everything, everybody is an idiot because they don't see the world the same way that we do. And I think when it comes to, you know, like that kind of politics is very, very difficult because when you start thinking about like the polarization in modern politics and you really, really take an acritical view and try to humanize like the other person, it's like, okay, you know, like it's very, very fashionable to say that Trump supporters are idiots and that, you know, they're just uneducated assholes, bumpkins who for whatever reason can't see the world as it is and they just chose like this egomaniac, whatever. But you know, when you say like, okay, maybe I, you know, I can't be that arrogant and maybe like really try to understand you know, what are the motives that people would vote for that person? You know, what are the cultural, social movements that are happening in a place that are leading so many people to actually think that that's a good idea, you know? And humanizing that person and listening to it, you very quickly find out that everybody makes very good points, yeah? Like liberals have very good points, conservatives have very good points, libertarians have very good points, apolitical people make very good, Everybody, when you really meet them and talk to them face to face and listen earnestly, not only to answer to them or to reply to them, but actually to really understand where they're coming from, everybody makes very good points. 
So I think, again, coming back to you know, that what I said before, I think like one of the most important things that psychedelics and ayahuasca and these things can give us is like that capacity for empathy that allows us to humanize each other constantly. Like our world is built on these dichotomies of polarizations, which by design require that we constantly dehumanizing each other. You don't agree with me, you're bad. Yeah, you don't, you know, like you don't uh, feel that male bodies should compete in female competitions, you're canceled, right? Like there's like, It requires that we constantly dehumanizing the other because if you don't agree with me or you don't think the way that I am, then there comes like that moral dimension that takes over. Like, oh, like you, you must be a bad person because it's inconceivable to me that you can say, right, that trans women cannot compete in women's sports. It's inconceivable to me that you say that women's the women cannot have free choice over their bodies and have an abortion it's inconceivable for me that you would like choose trump to you know like like that distance between our humanities that we actually say it's inconceivable to me that you can think that way that's already a, i mean we're already lost like that's already like we, we lose everything because we're unable to relate to our person's experience so the one thing that I think psychedelics are crucial for, and probably one of the things that they do intrinsically do by their own power is it allows that capacity to empathize with the other person so we can re-humanize them and say like, oh, I may not agree with the way that you see things, but I definitely understand why you would see them that way. And I think that's kind of like the crucial point of it. So uh, one of a good friend of mine, Leor, uh, Leo Rosman is also a colleague of mine in the Imperial College Lab, uh, Imperial um, Psychedelic Center. He is doing his postdoc research on uh, mediating conflict between Palestinians and Israelis with the help of ayahuasca. And I mean, he's, uh, there's actually a few things that he already published. I can uh, maybe like, share the links later with the listeners if you're interested. But you know, like this idea that ayahuasca can be used as an agent to mediate conflict uh, is based exactly on its capacity to allow us the empathy to humanize the person in front of us. And even without agreeing, at least being able to dwell in the complexity that that person has an opinion based on a life experience that is valid, that we may not agree with, but that is valid. So like that humanizing is kind of like the step that is always the first most important step to resolve any conflict because at least we're accepting the humanity of the other person and understanding and agreeing that even if we don't see things eye to eye, both of our experiences are to some extent valid, yeah? which is kind of like what we always miss when we're kind of making these polarities. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think ayahuasca has that capacity. Uh, not only ayahuasca, I think many substances, many plants do have the capacity to take us out of our own ideological cocoon so we can empathize and humanize it. So, you know, like that, I think that would be the tagline that I would like to maybe use at some point, just like, you know, like relentlessly humanizing each other. Like that's, that's kind of like the key to many of our modern conflicts that are like, you know, acknowledging our mutual humanity, like, hey, I may not agree with you, but I definitely see where you're coming from. You were talking about in the beginning how one of the problems you saw with the, the more Western psychiatric model of medicine was not seeing the person in their entirety. And it, a lot of that seems to be a product of, of something, again, that, that's good and bad, this more like reductionist way of medicine which is amazing because as you specialize, as you reduce something more and more, you have a better understanding of it, of that thing itself. And, and in that way, medicine is able to, to grow exponentially. And yet the downside of that is you begin to lose the sight of the, the picture as a whole. And you know, even like a general practitioner, like I remember my great grandfather was an osteopath. He would do house calls and 
you know, one of the fascinating things in my journey was this idea of, of diagnosis, like, because it was something that was very foreign to me in the beginning and, and something I feel I have a, a better grasp on. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert. Um, but even thinking about that, like one of the fascinating things about that general practitioner in that house call is when you go to see someone, you begin to develop a, a very a much larger context of, of who that person is. Like, how are they living? What are their finances? What is their family situation like? How do they how do they keep their house? Is it neat? Is it organized? Is it is it dirty? Is everything unkempt? And there's a lot of things that can be learned when you begin to learn about someone in, in a bigger picture. And so you, you were speaking about this idea of, as you see, one of the failures of the more Western psychiatric model is only seeing kind of the end product, labeling that as bad, and then prescribing them a certain medication that's going to try and cover that up somehow. If someone isn't really familiar with this work, I would think something they may be thinking is, okay, well, that makes sense to me, but it seems like now you're just prescribing them this other thing, whether it's ayahuasca or some other plant medicine that now we're saying is going to do the same thing, but somehow do it differently. So where do you think, and you touched a little bit about it, that it's not just the medicine itself, but the context in which it's taken, but where do you see the difference between uh, however we want to put it, a, a, a pharmaceutical that's meant to somehow bring the chemicals and the brain back into balance versus one of these plant medicines, which obviously is something that's interested you because otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. But you, you must then see that there's some benefit that these plant medicines or more traditional indigenous ways are actually able to help that person who isn't necessarily receiving that help in a more Western setting? Yeah, I mean, that's such a good question. It's a tricky one too. Um, one thing that I do, I have perceived is that actually many people come to plant medicine work because they feel that they have exhausted their options with Western systems. Uh, a lot of the people that we, that we see at the temple, particularly after you know decades maybe with depression, and stuff, people who have tried you know, they've been on antidepressants, they've tried like different forms of psychotherapy uh, and they really exhausted their options. So they see oftentimes ayahuasca, maybe not as a last option, but as something rather radical that they're willing to try because nothing else works. Uh, I think may maybe more and more that's going to be less the case because there's better um, education, there's better communication, there's more evidence that ayahuasca actually does help. So maybe more and more people are going to be like seeking ayahuasca to begin with, without going through the whole via crucis of the psychiatric system. But I think until recently, at least, most people are people who are disenchanted with medical system in the West and they want to try something new. And there's many reasons why they find better answers um, with ayahuasca. These are, again, like these are very complex, at least in my analysis. One of the main ones, I think, um, you were mentioning, first of all, the medical industry in the West is exactly what I just said. It is an industry. It is not a for-profit, benevolent edifice that just wants to help people. It's first and foremost a major integral central part, part of a neoliberal capitalist economy. So the bottom line, as always, is going to be productivity. And what that happens when profits take precedence over well-being, inevitably, well-being is going to suffer. Yeah, so I think like a lot of people don't get the best treatment for many reasons, including the fact that there's an inherent incentive for, to maximize profit uh, as opposed to maximize well-being. With psychiatry, it's very clear because for example, uh, pharmaceutical companies have an incentive to not cure anything, but rather to suppress symptoms. A person who is kept on a lifelong supply of medicaments that are just gonna make him feel good enough to continue doing what they're doing 
is ideal because then you have a client for life. You cure somebody, that's it. You know, like they don't need you anymore. So, I mean, I don't say the people do this maliciously or the researchers are not interested in coming up with like real solutions, but the incentive already is skewed towards treating symptoms as opposed to treating the Do the opposite. Yeah, like, I mean, at least, again, like I don't know psychedelics per se do the opposite, but psychedelics embedded within the medicalized narrative that we assign to it that oh like you're drinking ayahuasca to do your work and you're drinking ayahuasca to get to the root source of your affliction within that framework of drinking ayahuasca to get to the root source of your affliction uh people find that very helpful because whether that's like metaphysically true or just a story that they're creating by the end of the day most of the times they're able to assign meaning to their suffering in a way that they weren't able to do within Western psychiatry system. Just being told, oh, like just depressed because you have an imbalance of neurochemistry in your brain and you're gonna take us, you know, maybe that's not very meaningful for a person, but for a person to say, oh yeah, like I now understand, you know, my depression stems from the fact that my brain developed in a certain way and, you know, my emotional growth was stunted because, again, like, you know, my mom didn't help me enough when I was a kid or so on and so forth. I mean, that's meaningful, yeah? So a person can say, well, you know, like, I can work with that. I can, like, you know, engage in practices to learn how to love myself better. I can, you know, there's a whole range of things that I can, it leaves open, like, a whole world of that, of, meaning for that person to interpret their affliction in a different way. Yeah, I say, you know, like you can say, for example, oh, like something that I have experienced, for example, is like people realizing that their diagnosis is just a diagnosis. This is something that a lot of people don't really think about because we have so much faith in the medical establishment, right? Like we have like all of this ritual of going to the doctor's office and the person is wearing a white coat and there's a stethoscope and there's a diploma on the wall and all of these signs that signal to us, oh, like that person is an expert. But like he went through 13 years of medical training and did all this work. So if he says something, I fucking believe him, right? Like that's kind of like the, 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 medical, the medical interaction is based upon like really promoting the authority of the medical uh, expert, right? Uh, this happens with the people. I mean, maybe we we'll go back to that later. Well, this happens in the opposite way with indigenous people too. But you know, so so a person who uh, absorbs and assimilates the idea that the psychiatric diagnosis is one hundred percent objective and true is very difficult for them to later kind of deprogram that. So like, oh no, like I've been depressed for you know nineteen years. I'm just a depressive person, or like you know, like my anxiety is like, whatever. Like it's part of my identity now because I was labeled as such by a doctor and now like that construct has become part of who I am. And then a person has a ceremony and they realize, oh, I mean, yeah, that's just a story. Like I'm not a depressive person. I've just been sad for a very long time and that can change. Like I'm not enslaved to my, you know, diagnose. I actually have the agency to do things if I, cho if I choose. I mean, it's not as easy as that most of the times, but just, one example of a person kind of like even just on a symbolic linguistic conceptual level changing the focus of like oh i'm depressed to oh i've been sad for a while i can actually change that so i think like you know like that capacity to reframe stories or to reframe our identity in a way that is more constructive towards a better or you know like less painful life experience is one of the main things that um, ayahuasca can be very helpful for that Western medicine doesn't really offer much. Now, another aspect of this work that oftentimes gets me in trouble when I'm trying to articulate the mechanisms underlying it, and this is also like, you know, like my personal belief, but I do think that a huge part of, um, you know, like Amazonian shamanism and ayahuasca, a lot of that is you know, performance. And when I say performance, I don't mean it as it's fake or it's just a performance as in diminishing from it, but rather that, you know, like, like, like curanderos and healers are extremely skilled at the very subtle art of the placebo effect. Yeah, like the enhanced meaning response. It's like, okay, we know 
that in order for that person to heal, we need to convince them that they can heal and that they should heal and that they're able to heal. So how do we do that in the most effective way? And this is, has been, you know, kind of like the main insight of all, you know, like shamans and healers and curanderos all over the world, right? Like if we want that person to heal, we need to somehow convince them that they're able to heal. I mean, different cultures do this in also different ways, right? Like there's some of them that are purpose, pur purportedly more authentic than others, many others which have been exposed as shams because they were appealing to some sort of like metaphysical reality. Oh, like that person was really sucking fragments of shards of glass from their belly, as opposed to like that person was very skillfully enacting, right? Like a way to convince that person that whatever was the source of that affliction is actually gone from their body. And now like the path is clear for them to heal. And again, like, I'm not saying that everything is a performance. I'm not denying the possibility that there is really a uh, metaphysical, energetic reality world where somebody is doing a sopla to somebody and there's really, I mean, these things can coexist, but still within that possibility, it's still true that a huge part of that effect is still psychological. It's still like that enhanced meaning response, which Uranderos very meaningfully and very skillfully managed to uh, initiate or catalyze their patients, right? So, you know, like this is something that is true not only in shamanism, this is something that is true in Western medicine. This is something that a lot of people don't realize because a lot of people are very attached to the idea that biological medicine functions according to very specific biological etiologies and every disease and every cure has a biological origin. But in recent years, there's a huge, you know, like growing field of placebo medicine and placebo research, which exactly tries to find the best ways in which we can enhance that meaning response so that whatever treatment we are doing, yeah, other than whatever actual energetic, physical, molecular effect has on it, it can also be enhanced oftentimes by many dimensions by the psychological dimension of it. And I mean, you know, in the temple, you can see that in small things, right? Like why, why do we insist so much that whenever a new group enters the temple, all the healers are standing there in their best Shipibo clothes and their best things. And, you know, like they're looking like very authentic indigenous Shipibo people. That's the first impression that they have to make to the guests, yeah, I mean, it, this has a massive effect because when people come to the Amazon, it's not only because they wanna drink a magic potion, it's because there's a whole story, there's a whole edifice that is very appealing to them. And every single step of that journey is crucial for your well-being. I mean, every factor, right? Like even just the fact that like traveling to a faraway country to receive healing is already a huge thing you know, because it's an investment. You know, like, oh, like, yeah, I mean, it's not just me going to a clinic you know, just around the corner for half an hour. Like, I'm putting away two weeks of my life traveling to a very faraway country, a culture that I know nothing about, drinking weird potions in the jungle with, I mean, this is a massive, massive. So even just the fact of deciding that you want to do that already catalyzes a massive placebo effect, which already kickstarts the healing. I mean, you know, like you, you hear that all the time, kind of like in one of those plant medicine cliches from facilitators. Oh, like, yeah, the plant knows even before you're going to diet it. So the healing process begins way before you even drink the plant. Okay, maybe, okay, but maybe also you already committed to a diet. So the healing process begins the moment that you actually commit to doing two weeks of isolation and diet. I mean, that's a massive thing. So, you know, like traveling to a new country, meeting the person, like doing the walk across the jungle, which you're like all sweaty, and there's bugs and everything is new. And like, where the fuck am I? And why the fuck did I choose to come here? And then you see like five beautifully dressed, like Amazonian Indians and with all guards. So, oh, like, yeah, like they look legit. They look super authentic. They're definitely going to help me. That creates a very different impression of whether they were just standing there in normal city clothes, which you know what they were 90% of the time, 
because like, wow, they're just regular people like you and I, they just look a little bit different, you know, but you know, it, it doesn't have the same effect. So there's a lot of things like that, that create very potent consciousness changes already, yeah, that are very, very, very significant in terms of healing effects. Uh, they are oftentimes overlooked because we focus a little bit too much on the mystifications and whatever energetic, you know, whatever fantasy we want to make of this world. I mean, I'm not saying that everything is a fantasy, but I think that oftentimes we just don't see the obvious because we're very, very attached to one particular mecha mechanistic explanation of how these things uh, should work. So, you know, like just paying more attention to the symbolic, paying more attention to enhanced responses to placebos, why we say the things that we do and what um, reactions that creates. It's the same, like if you tell a person, um, you know, I mean, oftentimes like a person goes to, to the healer and, you know, in the middle of the workshop, like somebody's like really, really attached, like, no, I really want to go and talk to the healers. And we're like, well, you know, like we already told you like what they said, there's no, it's like, like, no, like I really want to hear it from them, right? And you cannot move them from it, like until you take them and so they hear exactly the same thing that you just told them, until they hear them from them, it, does, it will never have the same effect because the moral, symbolic, medical authority that they hold in their minds by the mere fact of being dressed the way they are and being people and being so forth already makes a huge difference. So, you know, it's all of these different layers that are extremely important for people to always be aware of when doing this work that are not necessarily only I like metaphysical magical aspects. Yeah. So then with that, <laughs> the, the actual medicines themselves, um, you must have seen in your research that, again, which drew you to that as well. Because again, before coming down, I mean, I'm sure there was, there was, some, there was some cognition, some knowledge that that was a part of it. And yeah. certainly after, after your experience there, seeing that that's a, that's a very significant part of it as well. But there also must have been something in you that, that, that saw that somehow these plants and, and the tradition in which they're worked in also had an ability to, to heal some of these conditions. Again, like you described, depression, anxiety, loneliness, that, that the Western pharmaceutical medicine didn't necessarily. Because again, as you said, even in the Western pharmaceutical model, a lot of people don't think about that. There, there's those very same things. There's the, there's the ceremony, there's the ritual, there's the authority. And yet seemingly this other system tends to be working better, again, for certain conditions that you mentioned than the, the Western pharmaceutical version. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that everything can be reduced just to the symbolic aspects of, you know, the social aspects of medicine. I think uh, there's actual aspects of both systems that differ very much uh, that are crucial. With, um, with ayahuasca, I guess, with ayahuasca, this is something I think I mentioned earlier, within that framework, within that framework of medicalized, therapeuticized work that we do with ayahuasca, again, like it does have the capacity to show people the deeper roots of whatever is ailing them so they can create a better story about it. Or, uh, you know, again, like it can be also that it's not only about like that person's inner journey and the psychology uh, about like thinking about their depression and like reconfiguring their ideas of depression and so on and so forth, but there's actually something else that is inherent to the interaction, whether that's in the ayahuasca itself or in the ikaro of the practitioner or in the diets that that practitioner has that is particularly uh, beneficial for that particular thing. So, you know, like there may be, and again, like these are things that people do express sometimes in interviews. They're like, oh yeah, like, like the thing that really, really helped me was that particular ikaro from that particular person. Like, I don't know what it was about. I don't know what the difference was between that Ica and other Icaros. There wasn't a very significant inner experience, but I know that that particular Icaro in that particular moment was crucial to my experience. So again, you know, like, like I'm not trying to completely throw out explanations 
about things that I don't understand. Yeah, I mean, I kind of like acknowledging that there may be, and I mean, I have had experiences like that where definitely, you know, I met or had encounters with things that I perceived to be intelligent and sentient and communicative. Some of them were plants. Some of them I kind of like knew which plant they were in my diets. Uh, you know, you kind of like I had like that very ineffable knowledge that, yeah, I mean, I am in communication with something that is not only a projection of my own mind in that sense. Um, so, you know, like ultimately, and I think this is kind of like one of the things that are very important, we can try and describe as much as we can the therapeutic mechanisms from our point of view. We can also try to record and interpret and then transcribe and translate poorly by the nature of the translation how the Shi people themselves or other indigenous people themselves experience and communicate all these things. And I say poorly because there's always gonna be mistranslations and equivoc equivocations just by virtue of different language and different understandings of concepts. Yeah, so when the person, when our Shi people says, yeah, I'm singing a song and the plant is curing the susto, there's many assumptions that I'm making here about what that person is saying. Yeah, like, what does it mean that that plant is curing? What does it mean when it says that song? What does it mean to say? So, you know, like we can try and translate as much as we can or experience in our own terms what it is that they say that they're doing. But by the way, there's always going to be a very big gap between what they describe doing and what we understand them doing by virtue that our fundamental experience of the world is different. We didn't grow up, I mean, we didn't grow up in the jungle, we didn't grow up in an animistic worldview. If at some point in our lives we decided, oh, like we're really fascinated by this work and we want to learn as much as we can, still there's always gonna be a very important limitation that is gonna be very difficult to reach by virtue of how our brain and our nervous systems develop through our, our you know, first years, uh, you know, and the fact that that didn't happen within an Amazonian community in the jungle, so we inherently going to perceive the world very differently. So I'm always very suspicious of people who are of from a Western culture, from a Western country, who claim to work in an authentic way according to some lineage or like okay maybe that's how you perceive it again but it's like all of these different epistemic ontological limitations and i mean i don't think there's anything wrong with people wanting to that work or learning to that work or then offering that work it's just about like really being honest about what it is that we're doing right like is this really like an authentic shamanic amazon what does what do any of those things even mean it's like okay there's a difference between saying oh i'm a practitioner from within the yawanawa lineage and i offer this work or as opposed to saying like, I learned from this lineage and I incorporate these insights or these lessons of this diet within the framework that I offer. And there's just many different ways in which things can be expressed in a way that is more authentic and more honest, as opposed to just trying to capitalize from the allure that many of these words have. Like, oh, like, yeah, people like authentic, people like, uh, you know, so I'm gonna, put that into my description. And I, I mean, again, not everybody might agree with the fact that there's always gonna be a gap for us as Western people in the way that we can even really approach an animistic worldview after a certain age of our development. Maybe some people, no, it doesn't matter. Like people are people and epistemics and ontology are, you know, not crucial. So we can always kind of, yeah, I mean, we can always approach to some extent the experience of the person, but. You know, I mean, the, the amount of people that have been living for years in the rainforest and they don't speak, let alone Shipibo or anything else, but Spanish, you know, it's astonishing to me, you know, that there's so many people that are apprentices of a shamanic Peruvian lineage and never took the time to learn the language. Not again, like not even Shipibo, but Spanish. I mean, these things are kind of like already, you know, like pointing towards something that is very important to acknowledge. And we are 
hybridizing and changing and incorporating and creating a new way of working that incorporates a lot of Amazonian things that incorporates our insights and our training within Amazonian lineages, but ultimately something very new. You know, like you were asking me about like the ethnographer's pre presence and how that alters the whole thing. The fact that we are in the jungle already is having a massive impact in how this work happens. You know, like the approach, like the way that younger generations are learning and approaching this work is already very different because there's already an incentive of working with Westerners because the money is so much better and because the work is easier in many ways. So, you know, like I have interviewed uh, younger Shipibo healers who explicitly told me like the, the way that we learn our work nowadays is very different than the way that our grandparents learned their work because now we are preparing ourselves to work in healing centers and retreat centers and doing ceremonies around the world. We don't want to work within our communities. We prefer working with Westerners. There's more allure, there's more status, there's more money. You know, so there's just specific things that we need to learn uh, and other things that are not as important, right? So this is already having a massive impact, not only in the work, but in the training of younger generations in also different ways. The fact that we're there, the fact that we're interested in this, and again, like not saying this from a place of judgment of like, oh, like everybody should be out of the jungle and like white people shouldn't be learning from indigenous healers. No, it's great. I mean, I'm happy to be an apprentice and a student of a Shipibo lineage. You know, I'm happy to diet with different teachers. I'm happy to be in the jungle. It's just a matter of like self-awareness. Yeah, I mean, our being there has an impact and how we, how we, focus on the future in co-creating a framework that is beneficial for everybody as opposed to just kind of like pretending to be something that it is and that's kind of like it's one of the things that's going to be very important particularly as these ideas of what is authentic and you know kind of like fade away i mean what is nowadays is difficult to even you know like you're dieting with a person um you know, social diets. I mean, what does a social diet even mean? You know, those are things that were kind of like ad hoc invented very recently because of the needs of the Western kind of like rhythm. So, you know, just interesting thoughts about what is authentic and what isn't and how we move forward together, kind of like incorporating different modalities. You know, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Like we, we work in an ayahuasca retreat center, but you know, there's yoga happening every day. There's sorts of different things that are not exactly traditional. Um, you know, and in, in, in the near future, that's kind of like already the standard, like, right? Like, like any retreat center that even hopes to attract people already has to offer also like yoga because people expect that. And now there's like a bunch of different younger people healers that talk to you in terms of chakras and yantra and like different terminology that they absorb from different things. So this already has been the nature of shamanism. It's always a melting pot of different traditions and different ideas and different knowledge and different people who travel and bring with them their ikaros. I mean, the ikaros have always been about power, right? Like the shaman who was the most powerful was the shaman who had the most ikaros because the ikaros were the symbol that you had traveled to faraway lands and learned the songs of those people and learned the songs of other people. So you came back to your community with new songs and people were like, oh, holy fuck, like that person has traveled places. Like he has brought us ikaros from, you know, upriver and downriver and so on. So there's kind of like this whole dimension of like melting that is crucial and very important to Amazonian shamanism but i think we're now seeing kind of like the explosion of it with so many people from all over the world coming into it and i'm really curious to see what things are going to look like in 10 years you know like what are the ceremonial design going to be like what is like a shipibo ceremony within a traditional shipibo context going to look like my feeling is that already that's going to be changed a lot you know like the idea that a ceremony consists on a person who moves around the circle singing to people as opposed to like a person calling somebody like, hey, I need to sing to you right now uh, because I perceive something needs to be sung as opposed to I need to sing to you because it's your turn for me to sing to you. I mean, there's a massive difference between all of those things. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of like a much longer discussion about how things have changed and are changing constantly by, you know, these constant intercultural interactions.
Where do you where do you where do you see that? Uh, I mean, a, a common theme, not just in this, but, but a, a lot of these shows is about balance. And, you know, as you were saying, it's uh, the, the sign of a good shaman in the past was actually someone who had literally, but also metaphorically, like ventured beyond themselves, someone who, whether that was going to a different tribe, going to a different dimension, you know, bringing things back that they could then use as tools to, to aid their community. Um, with the introduction of the Europeans, with Africans, I, I mean, as I think we've talked about before, I mean, there's a huge Christian influence, not just literally, but just in the, in the cosmovision of people, there's a, there's a big African influence. Um, and even it seems like a lot of these cultures, I mean, the one that, that always comes the, the strongest is, is Amika, who you also sat with, like, even in their mythology, and again, you know, this is according to him, but even before the Europeans and Africans came, they had a mythology that this was what was going to happen, that essentially the indigenous way of being as it was being practiced had a time limit. And that time is essentially now over. And again, this isn't, you know, my, my saying or whether it's good or bad, that's his own story. Yeah. And that essentially that time has come to an end. And now it's the time of what he calls the Diro Amasa, which is the, the children of the new dawn, the, the children who can bring the medicine from the four directions to create a new Maloka, to create a new way of being. And yet at the same token, I mean, it seems like that's always something that's been happening. Maybe now it's being accelerated to, as you said, a dram dramatic degree, because we do have people from all over the world. There's this amazing transfer of knowledge and energy via what we're doing right now through the internet, through a you know smaller world and the ability to get around. So do you think it's just a, a natural progression and, and, what do you think is that balance, you know, as you said, between uh, like, I always use the the analogy of martial arts, because that's something I, I, I find a lot of joy, but but also wisdom in and it's an interesting thing with mixed martial arts, because it's it's experiencing the exact same thing before you had all of these different lineages, you had, you know, karate and taekwondo and wrestling and boxing and jujitsu and aikido. And they were all their own system. They were all their own cosmovision. And yet what was seen was any of them in and of themselves had dramatic shortcomings. And this new martial art has emerged, which there was a tremendous resistance towards because it was seen that it, it wasn't rooted in a lineage. It was kind of this, oh, well, they're just taking whatever they want. And, and yet, you, in a way, you can't just take what you want. Every, anything you're taking is grounded in a tradition, like it's coming from somewhere. And essentially, they were taking what worked from any of these different systems and leaving behind what didn't work and creating something new, which is now very effective. And yet, the downside of that is traditions can be lost and, and some of maybe the nuances that weren't understood at the time and may be seen as not being useful only because they didn't fit in the paradigm of the worldview that was happening at that instance, they're lost. Whereas potentially in a decade or two decades, if that's still there, that can be seen as something that was integral and only because we've reached a certain point is that now seen as being useful. And if we lose those traditions, then we potentially lose, you know, all of that knowledge. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that actually already happened. Um, yeah, I mean, I think those things already happened. I think throughout history already many times we have lost crucial aspects of many systems of thought or many, spiritual systems by not understanding why certain things were important. Um, one thing that I have in mind, for example, when it comes to Amazonian culture is particularly that animistic, like that animistic outlook and the ritual dimension of it, right? So for example, if you think about it, this is kind of, this is kind of like the disenchantment of the Western world and how we came 
to create a civilization that was built around the idea that the world was inert and a collection of objects to be exploited as opposed to a living sentient being that we were stewards of that needed to be taken care of. This is, I think, one of the crucial differences between traditional like communities and societies who still live according to more grounded values and kind of this disenchanted West that really has completely lost sight of our embeddedness within our ecosystem. So, you know, if you think about it, like that difference between the world being a collection of objects and the world being a community of subjects is the crucial difference that it makes a difference between I go to the jungle and I see a beautiful lush screen of greenery and I think, wow, how many oil is underneath that? Or I see like this beautiful landscape with mountains and rivers and animals and like, wow, I wonder how much gold or silver can I extract from it, right? And this is exactly the kind of thinking that happens when the world becomes disenchanted and all of these landscapes become inert and just exploitable as opposed to like, wow, what a beautiful screen of green. Every single tree and plant in this landscape is my family. We are related, you are, you are my kin, right? That mountain is my kin, that's, you know, mountain goat, we're all family. So it's a very different approach. And I think one of the main ways in which that knowledge has been rooted in reality for many, many millennia has been through ritual and ceremony and so on. So there are many things that might seem dumb to people nowadays. They definitely sometimes seem dumb to me. I'm like, okay, you know, like whatever, I, I, can, I can see that it is important for Andean people, for example, to have names for each individual mountain and, you know, like do ceremonies, like thanking each individual mountain and like personifying that mountain. I'm like, well, okay, I don't really think that that mountain is an actual person with an actual spirit, with an actual age. Okay, maybe, maybe they are, but you know, like beyond like the metaphysical aspect of the world, it's just like, you know, outdated, like primitive beliefs about what persons are like and so on and so forth, like not understanding that whatever, you know, but when you think, when you think about it, like, well, no, this is not only about metaphysics, this is not only about spirit, this is actually encoding in the metaphor, a very, very important deep eco-social reality, right? Which is like, hey, if we enact these rituals, and we engage with the landscape as if they were real persons, we are much less likely as people and as a culture to exploit that or to cause them harm, right? Um, so if I address the jungle as my community, like, hey, like I'm going to visit my cousin, the Katawa tree, or I'm going to visit my brother, the Lupuna tree, or I'm going to visit my sister in the river, who, whatever. Yeah, when I personify all of these different natural occurrences of the landscape, it is much less likely that I'm going to allow myself or others to cause them harm or over exploit them or somehow infringe the harmony in the balance. Which again, we go back to like Amazonian perceptions of illness and disease. Like always people get sick because they infringe in these norms of reciprocity, uh, harmony and balance. So again, like this ideas are just more than empty rituals that have no purpose. It can be very easy for somebody from the West and oh, like I really love working with San Pedro is a beautiful medicine. I just don't really get like the whole ritual and the mesa and like why this thing, like fuck it. I just gotta take the plant and give it to that person. And it will work. Yeah, I mean, it will work. Of course it will work. I mean, it will work in a very different way than if you have like the whole ritual setting, because if you actually understood why things were the way they were, you probably would understand that they're actually encoding a system of values. Yeah, they're a way for that culture to reproduce and perpetuate those values with other people through direct experience. You know, you're giving people a direct experience to understand personally, deeply, viscerally, yeah, like, yeah, like that mountain is your brother, like that tree, that plant, like everything around you, this is your family, yeah, don't ever fucking forget that, because if you do, we're all gonna go extinct, yeah, and this, I think, what happened to the Maya, you know, somewhere down the line, they kind of forgot 
about those values of reciprocity. They built a civilization that was unsustainable, got extinct. I think this is what's happening with Western, Western industrial civilization somewhere along the line. We've completely lost our connectedness to the deeper realities of reciprocity. We're like, okay, we're just going to exploit this star. Um, we're just going to exploit this rock until you know we all go extinct. So you know, yeah. I mean, if we had preserved that knowledge a little bit better, and not necessarily. I mean, I don't mean that everybody should be, you know, an animistic person by like going around during rituals and praying to trees and so on and so forth. But if we had preserved a little bit more the nuance of what these rituals and ceremonies and festivities. I mean, you know, like we. Talking about calendar, like nowadays, most of the Judeo-Christian holidays and celebrations kind of having hijacked by commercial or whatever, you know, back in the day when you had like an important cosmic event that was marked by a ceremony and so on and so forth, which is very important. It's like, this is not just a holiday that you get off work so you can go do whatever. It's like, we are marking a very important passage in which the spring, you know, gives way to whatever. And then, you know, we need to remember that, you know, this is very important for us to remember because this ensures that every year the same, the same cycles continue perpetuating themselves so we have enough food. So having this festivity, having this ritual marking like the fecundity of the spring and then like the dead and rivers of winter, this kind of like a culturally coded mythic way of thinking that allows people to say, yeah, I mean, we are people that are completely subservient to something much bigger than we are. Yeah, I mean, we're not self-sufficient, self-reliant individuals. Uh, if we don't live our lives in harmony and balance with the laws of nature, then we're all gonna fucking die because we can't subsist if the harvest is not good enough if we fuck up our environment and there's too little rain or too much rain or too much snow i mean we are very 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 fragile beings when it comes to finding that goldilocks zone where life in this planet becomes possible and i think that's like what many civilizations have learned along the way it's like if you don't really keep that wisdom well embedded about how important it is to always maintain that reciprocity and harmony with the living world around us, then that's always gonna end badly for that civilization. What is unique about our days is that we have reached a technological point in a globalized world where what is in jeopardy is not only Western civilization, but the continuity of life in this planet. So that's gonna make the, the stakes are a little bit higher, I would say. In the beginning, you talked about one of the things that, that intrigued you was when you were working in, in these mental facilities and you saw people who were diagnosed as being schizophrenic, um, that it seemed like, like maybe the, the diagnosis wasn't correct or it was, it was labeling something on top of something without necessarily understanding what was going on and that kind of that that line between sanity and insanity is very fine and that potentially just in that system it's like what's actually happening is maybe not being understood um, can you talk a little bit more about that and uh, do you think these these plant medicines have potentiality because that's always like a really controversial subject like like Will these plant medicines just exacerbate that person's condition, uh, or or is there a way that that can actually bring them into a state of? Because again, it's tricky. Like, is that <laughs> obviously there's people who are unwell? Yeah, you know, that's that's the more reality end of the spectrum, and yet the other end of the spectrum is potentially they're just misunderstood, or they're operating in a framework that actually just a lot of people don't understand. Uh, we usually label it as bad or less than, but it could be in in a different context that person is actually operating just in a system that we can't understand. Yeah. Um, so maybe just yeah, speaking a bit about that, like your experience about what those people were going through, what maybe you saw that they were seeing, and and is there is there a path with these these medicines that could potentially help some of these people, or help us to better understand them? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was that was one of my first experiments that I ever did 
uh, as bio essays. I used to work in the inpatient ward of a psychiatric hospital in Israel. And I had that intuition that perhaps for me to connect on a deeper level with the people that were there, which were all people who were diagnosed with psychotic disorder uh, in the inpatient ward. So they were in acute, they were in the acute stages of psychotic episodes. So it's very, very hard for uh, and after a few times that I went there, I had the intuition that maybe if I took some LSD and went back, I might be able to vibe in a different vibration that would be more relatable to them. That was one of the most intense drug experiences that I ever had, but also one of the most illuminating because immediately the whole, I mean, when, once I went to work uh, under the influence of, and I didn't take a big dose, it was three mild dose, but enough for it to be perceptible for myself and obviously others because everybody picked up on it immediately. And the interactions that I had with people were incredibly different and much more fulfilling and intimate than I ever experienced before in that environment. And again, like it can be many things. It can be that they picked up on some vibrational difference on me. It may be that you know, the mere fact that I was trying something different predisposed me to be more open and more empathetic. I mean, there can be many things, but the fact is I did that experiment and it really blew my mind uh, how easier it was for me to, to communicate and relate to them. And again, we come here to that dichotomy that we were talking about before, nature and culture, right? Like, okay, how much of what we think of as madness is culturally constructed and how much of that is actually you know, like a real biologically rooted thing that that person is not okay. I think obviously there's both and there's a combination of both. Uh, our definitions of sanity, our definitions of insanity, our definitions of madness, or even, you know, what it means to be happy and healthy, all of these things are culturally constructed. Okay, it's not the same thing to say this person is mad in the United States than saying this person is mad in the Amazon. This is kind of one of the main insights also from the field of cultural psychiatry. My own experience, for example, is very interesting, right? Like in the West, we tend to think of schizophrenia mostly in cognitive and behavioral uh, parameters. So like that person is having weird thoughts, so that person is like speaking about things that we don't really, they're not really coherent, behaving in ways that do not conform to whatever social norms we expect from a person in that situation, all of those things will be kind of classic uh, manifestations that something is not right with that person. That person might be a little bit crazy. But you go to the rainforest, for example, and I ask this question to some people, like, hey, like what, what, what do you say about like a crazy person? What, is, what do you mean by a crazy person? And the responses are very different. Like, you know, like for example, I remember like something really stuck my mind, like, oh, yeah, like, you know, like a person who harvests a lot of yucca and it's too much yucca. Like he cannot eat all of that yucca. He cannot sell all of that. He has a surplus of yucca. And instead of making masato and having a party or instead of sharing that with the rest of the community, he just keeps that in his cellar and lets it rot. Uh, that person is insane. Like that's madness. Like it is inconceivable that a sane person would have a surplus of something that is useful for somebody else. And instead of sharing it with other people, it's just hoarding it. So basically the archetype of success that we glorify in industrialized Western cultures, that is the very definition of insanity and madness in egalitarian Amazonian cultures. So I found that very interesting, just the parameters that we use to define what is sane and what is insane. Yeah, they're culturally constructed. In terms of like the Western definition of what a mad person or an insane person is, you know, again, like, I think I have come, I have come across different people who fit different rubrics. I definitely came across people who I felt were very special people, who were very misunderstood people whose experience was so out there and so unique that it was easier for us as a society to say, you know what? I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't wanna deal with that. So you're gonna go, you know, you're gonna be institutionalized. And if you wanna talk about that shit, you talk about it with other people because we don't wanna hear about it. 
I think there's a lot, a lot of persons that fall, you know, fall between the chairs of Western medicine, particularly Western psychiatry, because we don't have the resources nor the inclination to actually listen to them and figure out what it is that their experience is about, which is a shame because I'm not saying that these people are potentially shamans, even though a lot of people in the history of the history of psychiatry and kind of like the history of anthropology of shamanism, lots of people have tried to say, yeah, like schizophrenic people are just misunderstood shamans. And so I think it's a little bit more complex than that. I think, yes, I mean, there is some parallels that people with certain inclinations towards certain sensory experiences can be more predisposed towards becoming, you know, that cultural social role of the prophet or the seer or the healer, or, you know, whatever it is that requires kind of like extra sensory input in that sense, yes. But at the same time, I don't think that's the whole story. I think there is a lot of people who are fucked up, not because they're special, but because they've been traumatized or they have also different genetic predispositions towards something. So it's very difficult to say, you know, like everybody is just traumatized or everybody is just like misunderstood shamans or everybody is just like genetically predisposed towards an experience. I think what I found in my personal experience of many years working with psychotic people is that the best way to approach it is by working together with a person openly to come up with a definition or an approach that makes sense to them and then they can work with it. I mean, if you come to- I'll add like a, a little footnote or something uh, that we, we had a technical difficulty. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we were, we were, we were, we were just kind of thinking about this, dilemma of whether people are diagnosed with psychotic disorders um we're kind of you know ah, okay so we were talking about like this idea that many people have tried to present that the diagnosis of schizophrenia in the west can be paralleled to experiences of other cultures whether they call them shamans or seers or rishis or prophets and so on, uh, which again, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice idea. And when it comes to what actually is useful, then it's a very individual thing about like knowing who you're working with and then helping them make sense of their condition according to their own world of experience. So yeah, I mean, not necessarily telling somebody, uh, hey, like your suffering should make sense to you uh, because you're actually a, a misunderstood special person who, you know, in a different culture would have been a very revered healer. So, I mean, not necessarily, not necessarily very helpful for everybody, particularly if that person doesn't really connect with that and like, hey, like, I don't want to be special. I just want to live a normal life. So don't tell me uh, I would have been a shaman. Just like, give me the right dose of the right drugs so I can go back to you know, live a relatively normal life, but for other person, you know, like that would have made sense. And they'd be like, you know, like stop drugging me. I don't want to take your antipsychotic things. You're inhibiting my innate capacity to perceive, you know, uh, extrasensorial information. So, you know, it depends a lot on where that person is coming from. Again, like I think like one of the constants, at least in the way that I address these things, is that the metaphysical or ultimate reality of things is not usually as important as the meaning making layer of it. And how do we facilitate that meaning making process? I think that's true for ayahuasca, it's true for psychedelics, it's true for mental health, it's true for psychosis in general. It's like, if we can really help that person reconfigure a story in a way that is coherent with their worldview, and that allows them a sense of age of agency and meaning in the world, and uh, that's useful. But if it's not, then it's not useful. So yeah, I mean, it, you know, like it can be that a schizophrenic person in the West, if they were born elsewhere because of their innate neural configurations, then they would have, you know, there's there's, there's a movement in Western mental health uh, neurodiversity, which is kind of like acknowledging the fact that 
you know, just as we have different attributes that change across cultures and across different uh, populations, also the neural configuration is not homogenous. And that not because not everybody fits the same neural you know, archetype or prototype, then that means that there's something wrong with them. This is very prevalent within the, you know, the autistic community. Like there's a big chunk of autistic people who are like, actually we're not sick, this is not an illness, this is not something to be treated, it's just something to be incorporated and accepted. We're neurodivergent, we have different capacities. Uh, there's another big chunk of autistic people who are like, fuck that, we don't want to be neurodivergent, we want better drugs and better treatment so we can function as normal people. So I mean, it is, this is like, again, like there's no right answer, it's just different people have different ideas of how they want to tell that story of who they are and what their life is about. So different things are useful for different people. Bipolar people very similar, like a lot of bipolar people are like, yeah, I mean, depression sucks and mania can be exhilarating and, you know, being in a manic state can be a fucking ecstatic experience, but also like a very dangerous one. So a lot of people can like try to navigate that as not a disease or an illness, but uh, a condition that confers dangerous gifts, they like to call it. It's like, okay, yeah, I mean, you know, like the history of creativity and arts, you know, has a lot of examples, of a lot of bipolar people who were incredible artists and painters and writers and so on and so forth, because, you know, when the person is having that period of manic exaltation, they produce like an inhuman amount of creative work. People can produce books and, you know, because they're, they're manic, they're, they're creative, they don't sleep, they don't eat, they're just creating, creating, creating. And then obviously there's the inevit inevitable crash and so on and so forth. So people are like, well, yeah, I mean, you can experience that as a debilitating disease. You can also experience that just as, you know, that. Like, you know, yeah, sometimes manic and very creative and then whatever. So like people make sense of their experiences using very different frameworks. Uh, the interesting aspect, well, not, not the only interesting aspects, but like what all this is leading to is like, can ayahuasca or psychedelics be beneficial for these things? You know, so if we take into account that ayahuasca and psychedelics are very useful tools for meaning making and for allowing us to create and craft different and better stories of what ourselves in the place in the world, then the answer would be yes. But also, yeah, the kind of like the, the institutionalized assumption, which usually excludes psychotic people from psychedelics, is that people who are labeled or diagnosed with psychotic disorders have an inherent difficulty integrating sensory and cognitive experience as it is. Now, schizophrenia literally means a split mind, that's not like a personality. Uh, disorder is like a split mind, like in literally the information doesn't integrate in the same way as it would with a neurotypical person. So the assumption is that for a person who has trouble integrating sensory and cognitive experience as it is, the psychedelic experience would exacerbate that difficulty and create a bigger schism that already exists. Um, that's, of course, the theory. In practice, things are different. I haven't met many people that have personal experience, but I've met a few. I know for a fact that many retreats, centers, and obviously people running clinical trials and many individual practitioners wouldn't take the risk because it is thought there is a much higher risk of having integra integration problems down the line. Uh, but you know, there's, in, there's individual anecdotic evidence of many people, both bipolar and schizophrenic, who have been uh, greatly helped. I met a couple, I mean, I personally met two people that were diagnosed with schizophrenia in the past who were part of kind of well-established uh, ayahuasca circles. This is in Israel many years ago. I don't know what's up with them today, but. I met one person who would attend regularly ayahuasca ceremonies and throughout the whole ceremony, he would just be drawing uh, in his notebook. And he was the same drawing over and over, which is basically a face. Uh, I don't remember if it was his face or somebody else's face, but like it was kind of like his ayahuasca experiences were about drawing this face that apparently had some deep meaning for him. And he, he, he told me 
that uh, since he started doing ayahuasca, it's not that the schizophrenia went away or that his experience changed that much, but at least the social part of his experience was very different because he had found a certain sense of community and understanding and people held him for what he was from within like that circle. I mean, I, I, again, like I think that's always gonna be the primary dimension of all of this work is the social component of it. Uh, there's a guy, a friend of mine called Benjamin Mudge, uh, who has been for many years presenting work in kind of like all the psychedelic conferences. He's writing his PhD on ayahuasca for bipolar depression. He himself is a person uh, with bipolar depression. So he draws a lot from his own experience, but also doing research with other person's experiences. So, I mean, who, he would be like a good, not authoritative, but at least a better source of experience uh, for bipolar and ayahuasca. I mean, again, like I personally think it's not so much about the diagnosis, but about the person as a whole. I think there's many people with different diagnoses who could very much benefit from ayahuasca. I mean, again, if there, if that diagnosis is present, that's definitely a red flag that requires that the person inquires a little bit more about other parameters of that person's life, you know, social support, world of symbolic meaning, so on and so forth. But I personally don't think that the diagnosis should inherently exclude anyone from ayahuasca, as long as whoever is running the ceremony or the retreat has the actual resources to be able to hold that space for that person if something does go wrong. Yeah, like if a person does have like a psychotic break drinks, I mean, it would require a commitment that that person has a long term arrangement for if and when they do require a much longer term integration setup, which is something that unfortunately very few people are able to, to, to ensure or offer nowadays. I mean, for the nature of, you know, the dynamics of retreat centers and the pressures of economic systems and so on, it's very, very rare that somebody can commit like, hey, like, yeah, I mean, come, you know, drink with us and if something goes wrong or something happens and we're, you're welcome to stay here as long as you need. I mean, that doesn't usually happen. There's a faster, higher turnover. So I think, if those conditions were met and that person had a safety net, it could be done. Uh, but that, that would require that commitment for sure from, from the person who is providing that. Yeah. So going back to your original thesis about <clears throat> this kind of ep epidemic of, of loneliness, of depression, of anxiety, how do you see things going? Uh, I mean, one of the the main things a lot of people are dealing with, especially with the pandemic, is seemingly more of that loneliness, potentially more depression, more anxiety, living in a virtual world, which on the one hand seemingly brings people together, and yet at the same time, kind of de facto is a, a detachment from other people, from physical interaction, from community, yeah. even this. I mean, it's bringing us together in one way, and yet, you know, it's unique in that we probably wouldn't do this if there wasn't this medium, but at the same time, it's it's a much different experience if we were doing this in person. Um, so do you think, where do you see that kind of going? And, and do you think these, these plant medicines, psychedelics are a potential remedy or something that will be much more kind of a component moving ahead if these things continue to, to go down that trajectory? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. I, yeah, I think, I mean, psychedelics and plant medicines are definitely one of the ways, one of the most po powerful ways in which we can help wider community kind of like recalibrate and regain that sense of belonging and that sense of empathy and that sense of like that relentless humanization of each other. Um, as psychedelics and plant medicines kind of gain more and more validation and legitimacy from the establishment and they become more accessible, that's one possibility out of many of what could happen. Uh, I, that's, what, that's the one that I would like to see, like really 
psychedelics being used in a way that brings that that emphasizes that sense of emerging communitas of communion of um, relatedness. This is you know this is, again like this one another one of those things like another one of those cliches that we hear and sometimes say a lot about psychedelics and particularly plant medicines that I oftentimes find very misleading uh, and very unfair is being this again because of the hyper medicalization and the focus that we're like giving about these things in relation to therapy it's like oh like you know like drugs are not for treating they're for healing or you know like this is not the war like like what is the war that we're doing about like this, this is not just for fun this is not just for heat for tripping like if you want to do drugs you want to see psychedelics then you have to like be serious about it you have to do your work like this is a very heal like this is there's a purpose for it which is healing a lot of people parrot those ideas act critically right actually i i mean i think it's a fallacy because this is like separating the recreational from the therapeutic, the fun from the work. I mean, all of these things kind of, again, play out in a very artificial construct that we have created about what doing the work means, which is influenced by this therapeutic culture where everything has to do about doing the work. Uh, whereas like self-analysis or, you know, like discovering another layer of trauma, like everything has to be worked. It's kind of like part of our Protestant ethical background where you're not allowed to have fun or do anything that is not productive and so on and so forth. So, you know, but for me, it is again like something that, you know, like not like some people get annoyed when I say, I don't mean this as diminishing the ceremonial design or diminishing the shamanic work or like, any like it, but like for me specifically, especially as a person, like the most powerful experiences that I ever had with any substance, with any drug, with any plant, with any, they haven't precisely been in a ceremonial therapeutic setting, but you know, they've been in a festival, like dancing my ass off to psytrance on three doses of LSD and half a bottle of tequila and like just glued to the, speaker for hours at an end and like just like that ecstatic communal experience of togetherness like everybody around me you know like hugging and like passing the bottles with mdma and like you know i like kind of that whole construct of like the communal aspect of the ecstatic festival scene i mean for me those experiences by far and wide have been the most healing even though i wasn't purposely in a healing space or or gearing myself towards healing but like you know for 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 a relatively alienated person like finding that sense of like first of all like the sheer amount of joy and fun that you can have you know with the right tools with the right music with the right environment under the right circumstances with the right people around you just like that hedonistic which a lot of people like to demonize hedonism and i mean i'm not, not talking about hedonism as a lifestyle but you know like like just like having fun like radical fun you know uh that's an incredible thing and a lot of people would actually benefit radically from like hey like stop doing your work for a moment and go dance your ass off you know like not everything has to be about like self-analysis and like sulking in like your corner and like think of things i mean yes these things are useful to some extent but there comes a moment where that becomes counterproductive. And I found that again, many times with a lot of people who are for many years dieting and doing their work. And it's, it's like this sense of like stuck, like being stuck in this loop of like, you know, like how much, how many times can you process the same thing you know, that your father didn't hug you enough or that, you know, like this thing had, and there, there comes a point where it's like, okay, yeah, I realize these things. I have been there many times. Like, but how do you move forward from it? Like, how do you integrate that into actually putting that into action and implementing that in life and so on and so forth? So, you know, like there's a therapeutic and there's a recreational, like that artificial separation between both of them. I think it's ridiculous. I think uh, recreational is incredibly therapeutic under the right conditions. I think what a lot of people mean unconsciously when they try to diminish from the recreational or demonize the fun part of that, it's like, well, 
okay, yeah, I mean, you can have fun in a festival, you can have fun just tripping out with your friends, but then, you know, you still have to kind of like put in the work of like integrating those experiences, so you can make positive, long lasting changes in your life. That's a whole different thing that can happen. I mean, that is necessary whether you're doing ayahuasca ceremonially dieting in the jungle or you're tripping out on ketamine and LSD with your friends in a festival or in the forest, it doesn't matter. Like it's still whether those things get integrated into positive long lasting changes, uh, you know, they're still up there for whoever is, has the inclination to actually put attention into it. So, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of value in dieting. I personally have benefited immensely from being on my own dieting plans, like not having my phone on me. I mean, as you said, like, I think like our attachment to screens and our social avatars and personas is probably the most damaging, toxic, thing that people haven't like realized yet you know like the the the, the impact in even in a neurological level that like social interactions or like social media interactions are having on us and misleading us into feeling connected while actually being more disconnected than ever i mean you know like social media is to actual relationships probably as an analogy what pornography is to intimacy it just kind of provides like a simulation and simulacra of something but it's not really providing the substance it's just really only providing the dopamine hits you know and i do i mean i feel that on myself very much like that loneliness that disconnection like that impulsion and compulsion towards trying to recover some sense of connectedness by being online and then ultimately like just realizing how frustrating that is um, so yeah, I mean, I think like for all depression, anxiety, loneliness, all these things, the social prescription should be primary. And the one thing that I would like to see, and the one thing that has always been kind of like my priority is like when we're talking about health and well-being, like we have to always bring back like that dimension of connectedness, of like acknowledging humans for the social animals that we are, and seeing that many many of the epidemics of psychosocial disconnection that we're experiencing nowadays have their roots in a very real way in that process of hyper individualization that erosion of our communities you know the fact that many of us nowadays don't feel a sense of belonging i mean not only to our family of origin but i mean you know back in the day it used to be like okay you have like an extended family or you have like a tribe or like it's not only like you and two other people who are you know it's like there's there's there's, there's this saying right like it takes a village to raise a kid I think that's one of the most beautiful uh, in real sayings that for a person to grow healthy and happy he has to be in constant interaction with a multitude of people who are you know part of an extended network of reciprocal kind of like closer intimate relationships. We have completely like lost most of that in most Western industrialized countries. I think a lot of us are intuitively kind of trying to recover that aspect by seeking environments where we can connect horizontally with also different like-minded people. Um, so I think like it's already happening in terms of like forming like bubbles of micro communities that are trying to live in a more intentional way or a more conscious way. And I think like we're failing miserably for the most part because we're still for different reasons, but at the very least we're trying, um, you know, to kind of like regain that tribal collective dimension. I mean, I have spent time visiting all sorts of different intentional communities and different setups where people try to live communally and like self-sustainably. And I mean, all of these things are great ideas and they sound great on paper. like oh yeah, like I'm going to go and like, you know, build a community with my friends and these other people and we're going to work the land and we're going to live off the land and fuck the system and so on and so forth. And I think what most of us realize pretty soon is that that's fucking hard. Like, you know, like not only like just micromanaging like human relationships on that level is a fucking whole, you know, full-time job, but like actually growing things and like working the land and like giving not just you know like making a fucking tomato sprout from the land is it's, it's incredibly hard like people don't 
have a frame of reference for how fucking difficult agriculture is and you know added to that the complexity of social relationships you know in that dynamic where you actually have to be transparent and vulnerable as much as you can with you know like a bunch of other people i mean that becomes uh you know like most most of those communities that i've seen either dissolve and people don't talk to each other ever again because there's so much conflict going on or they turn into authoritarian cults or so on like there's very few like beautifully functioning smoothly operating intentional communities at least that i have come across that don't become toxic so i mean i think we have the right idea we just you know don't have many tools and skills yet to create that beyond industrial civilization um, and again like i think we can still create that within cities you know um, in a way that is more beneficial but i mean it does require that we start prioritizing again um, other parameters that are not necessarily only like intra psychic therapeutic, personal, individual, like my own process, my own drama, but like, hey, like, yeah, like, you know, like you're embedded within a network of people, you know, maybe if you had a better support network, then, you know, like your depression wouldn't seem as difficult because there was, you know, like you just have like these other relationships that are like taking care of you and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it's just, it's tricky. There's different, there's different aspects of it, but definitely, Definitely, I think like that loneliness and alienation and disconnectedness um, is a crucial aspect, not only from each other, but you know, like again, like Shipio people or Amazonian people to some extent still have like that animistic lifestyle where it's not only about human people, there's non human people, there's still a closeness with other beings, you know, that I think that's kind of like also part of that alienation. It's not only like human social alienation, but that sense of disconnection from our world that. Again, it just seems to us as an inert collection of objects as opposed to like a sentient communicative community of subjects that we can interact with. But I mean, I say that for myself, this is one of my limitations, right? Like I spent four years in the jungle and you know, I hate the jungle. I mean, I, I don't hate it as in like, I hate the jungle, but it, you know, like it's not a comfortable environment for me to live in. It's not that I'm, you know, go outside and I'm like hugging the trees and like, you know, reveling in the humidity and the mosquitoes and like so grateful for, no, I mean, I fucking hate it. I feel comfortable in an urban environment. I like being in man-made structures. Like I ha I like to have like AC and so on and so forth. You know, and for me, it's like, I, I, I don't think that I, that I have the capacity to really like meet a tree and be like, oh yeah, like I recognize the humanity in the tree or like, you know, like I see, I mean, yeah, it's beautiful and it's amazingly complex and they're communicative in their own way. But, you know, I, I, I still have like my limitations when it comes to the other than human interactions. I mean, I, I you know, like, I don't know, like I, I wasn't raised in that environment. I, you know, I'm a city boy. So, I mean, I, I recognize that's my limitation. I don't think that other people have the same thing. I think it can be a beautiful experience to like really feel that intimacy with earth and like make love to the you know tree and like being that kind of like, like intimate emotional relationship with all sorts of different features of the world. Uh, I appreciate that, but that's, you know, not, not my experience so far. Yeah, it's part of that alienation, I think. Yeah. So where do you see yourself going? You, you're, you're writing this thesis, this book. Uh, you said you're doing some integration work. Uh, do you have a sense of how things will unfold for you? Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of things that I'm kind of engaged in and planning. We're also, um, I mean, I'm working here with a friend that I met here in Puerto Vallarta. Um, we're running retreats. I mean, it's a very different model because we're not centered around any psychedelic but they're more kind of like general wellness retreats that incorporate different modalities and as part of that i'm bringing a little bit of uh, my knowledge in psychedelic um modalities uh so you know like we're growing that uh, in october we're gonna start again i mean we had a few groups in the beginning of the year and then we stopped for a while as we were looking for a different location and also summer is a low season but we're gonna resume that in august and it's going great. Uh, they're all sold out. There's lots of people coming in. It's a, it's a good 
spot to do those things. But I mean, eventually, like the plan is that I want to create kind of like my own uh, offering, which I am not, I don't have clarity precisely about what that looks like. It's kind of like it's changed and mutated a lot throughout the last few years. But my original idea uh, stem from my experience working in the psychiatric system. And then something that we haven't spoken about, but also has been very formative in my outlook is that I've been working for many years um, in harm reduction spaces in electronic music festivals and so on. So from then I kind of had, that, I mean, after every festival, I mean, whatever, you know, boom festival or Burning Man Festival or whatever big festival it is, I mean, you do see a lot of people and at the end of each festival, there's still always gonna be a handful of people who have nowhere to go um, because of whatever reason, they don't have a home or they're still tripping too hard or they still need like an integration place. These people oftentimes end up or in the local psychiatric system or the police station, or sometimes we even have to call family members so they can come and pick them up in a different country because there's nowhere to put them. And I think in a general sense, one thing that we are lacking very, very sorely in the mental health field is precisely sanctuaries or havens for people who either have been diagnosed in a way that doesn't fit their own story and they want to explore their experience in a non-pathologizing environment or people who have had enough of psychiatric uh, cycles or people who either for organic reasons or because they took something and whatever happened people who require kind of like a longer term uh, integration so the, the what i envision is a place that doesn't necessarily function as a fully functioning retreat center or medicine based anything but rather a place where uh, living community of people is co-creating a space for people who require more empathy, more time, more space in a non-pathologizing environment to actually make meaning of their suffering beyond whatever options are given in either psychiatric systems or uh, whatever alternatives are offered out there. So like the approach is really kind of like a community that is also a therapeutic community for people who are seeking alternatives to whatever they're being offered. I mean, I, I don't want to work obviously with, with psychedelics and drugs and plants and so on and so forth, but I, I don't want that to be the primary tool. I want that to be another one out of many different approaches that we have. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, like I, I, I'm, I've been looking for land for a while. I like Mexico a lot. I like Peru a lot. Um, I do have a maybe artificial, maybe real kind of like sense of urgency. I, I don't like to get too deep into apocalyptic, messianic, whatever, but I do have a sense of, um, Things of, I mean, you asked me before, like, where are we going from here? Like, I hope I'm wrong, but my sense is that things are going to get much worse before they get better. Um, I think the way that our systems are set up, um, probably in our lifetimes, we are going to experience the collapse of many structures that we have taken for granted for too long. Uh, and from the chaos that ensues, then that's going to be our opportunity to maybe co-create something new and something different. I don't have much hope that the current systems have the capacity to self-reflect enough to actually backtrack what's already in motion. So, I mean, I hope I'm wrong. I hope, you know, like some, maybe, like maybe, you know, technology is going to save us or maybe uh world leaders are somehow gonna you know get together and say like you know what we're actually gonna enforce like i mean again these things are tricky right because we it, like the epistemic dimension of it is very murky like we try to make sense of the world but we're always kind of like faced with 
epistemic problems or biases, misinformation, like, you know, like the fact that most institutions don't really have much credibility anymore. So, you know, it's kind of like a tricky thing because on one hand, like, well, you know, I would like somebody to do something about it. You know, like our world is collapsing, the ecosystem seems to seem to be collapsing, but at the same time, you know, like if anybody tries to impose any totalitarian vision, like, oh, like we're going to save the world, so we're going to, you know, like enforce lockdown. I mean, like, well, I don't trust anybody. Like, I don't want any authoritarian leadership to tell me what to do and what not to do. So it's kind of like, you know, a very tricky situation where any authoritarian response to something that probably does require a collective engagement is going to be suspicious. So yeah, I mean, my sense, and this is just kind of like me talking out of my apocalyptic mindset, but I do think that it is likely that in the next decade or two, when our life support systems reach capacity and all these predictions start increasingly becoming exponential and the ice caps melting and cities overflowing and so on, uh, you know, and things start collapsing, then that's probably where uh, the dreamers and the visionaries and the people who are holding those visions of the Dilawa and so on and so forth, they're gonna, you know, have the opportunity to shine and co-create a new reality that follows those ideas. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's like every, you know, another one of those cliches that we like to say a lot in the medicine world, um, you know, uh, transform crisis precedes transformation. You know, it's very difficult to really bring ourselves to do the hard work that transformation requires unless we're forced to do that. And the only way that we're going to be forced to do that is by crisis. So I think that also applies on a planetary level. So that's kind of my prediction is she's going to go down. We're going to be forced to grow up. And then from the ashes and the rubble of whatever is left of our world, then those of us who make it through, uh, you know, who hold that vision or hold that flame, like, hey, like a different world is possible. Then, uh, you know, we're going to hopefully hold that light for others. Uh, I might be wrong, you know, maybe Western civilization in, the, in its current uh, configuration still has lots of steam and centuries of whatever. Who knows? I think futurologists are always, you know, mistaken anyway. So, but yeah, that's, I mean, as, 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 as far as my own personal little insignificant life i think like the one thing that i that i did get a lot of clarity on during this pandemic is that i don't ever want to find myself in a situation where something like that happens and i'm stuck somewhere where i don't have access to resources where i'm in a foreign country and i'm just like you know like you know like where where, where are we gonna like get food and do can, can we travel and who do i know and like some like I think that like, it's not like preparing for collapse, but I do want to make sure that as things exacerbate, I have a piece of land where I can have access to some veggies and I have maybe like a well of water and like refuge for my family and my friends. Like, hey, like she's going down, you know, like we build this place, come hang out. And I think that's kind of like, you know, like where many of us are headed, you know, like just kind of like micro communities, pieces of land that are conscious or kind of like, you know, like, based on that shared understanding of like, hey, like if we wanna, you know, like move through whatever cultural, historical process we're moving through, then we have to do it uh, together. We have to do it with empathy. We have to do it with closeness to the land that we inhabit. We need to do it like respectfully. You know, that's, that's kind of like just the thing. Like how can we be better embedded uh, in communities and, and also in our uh, landscapes. So that's kind of like where I'm at. I'm, you know, like looking for land, hoping to spend more time gardening and creating community within my local environment. Yeah. That seems like a good way to wrap it up. Self-sufficiently yeah. with community. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, great, Adam. Thank you so much. Um, I think you shared so much information. My computer overheated at one point and crashed and we had to uh, <laughs> start yeah. up again. But um, is there anything else we, we didn't touch on that you'd like to talk about? Um, no, I, mean, I think that was pretty comprehensive. And there's always, there's always room for you know, endless conversations about all of these fascinating topics. Um, but yeah, no, I think I think I think we're good. I think like really like the main the main messages of 
you know, connectedness and community and like the relational aspect of this work and kind of like not losing ourselves in this navel gazing, hyper therapeutic, very medicalized approach that seems to be, you know, more common. And yeah, and the epistemic humility, I think like this is the one thing that for me, you know, I think as a person, but also in a, in a sense as an educator and also definitely as a facilitator is like, like really communicating effectively about how to think about complex nuanced topics in a way that is fruitful, but also that conserves and preserves that complexity and that nuance. And I think that's the one thing, you know, that if I could like really devote myself to one thing, I think that would be the thing, like really how to find ways to talk about difficult things with nuance and with complexity, with empathy, you know, without like reducing them or creating like cartoonish versions of them uh, and so on. So yeah, it's just epistemic humility, you know, like the Socratic maxim, you know, all I know is that I know nothing. Well, maybe we know a little bit, but we can communicate about those things like hum with humility. Um, yeah, I think like the big, this may be like the last thing, like the biggest enemy of this work in particular, that I, at least in my view, like the worst enemy of this kind of wor work that is inherently mysterious, inherently incomprehensible, inherently ineffable, is certainty. And I would like more of that awareness that certainty about anything, I mean, certainty about metaphysics, certainty about what worldview or what framework is the right one. I mean, certainty about any of those things is not nearly an appropriate response for the magnitude of the mystery that we're dealing with when we're working with these substances and these plants and these modalities of thought really like that's just that's just it yeah well i think that's certainly something uh we can all use more of is uh, more discussion more complexity nuance empathy compassion understanding so Thank you very much, Adam. It's uh, it's beautiful having uh, voices like yourself on and, and from that place of experience and your own point of view and just that honesty and 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 really a willingness to, to look at things from all angles. I, I think that's really important. And um, uh, I mean, not just in this work, but as I was saying, in the world in general, it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, that I think that place of humility and and being able to look at at at, at complex ideas uh, in a nuanced way is is so vital, and it's uh, I, I think it really helps to to allow things to grow and to flourish and and to create new things while at the same time holding on to tradition. So, yeah. thank you very much, man. It's it's been a pleasure. Yeah. It's it's good seeing you. It's uh, it's nice to see your smile and catch up with you. And uh, I think we went probably close to four hours and. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we can do part two and uh, equal, if not yeah. surpass that. So, uh, yeah, man, I, I wish you all the best and um, and and keep in touch. And and thank you again for doing this. I, I, yeah, I hope this gets it. out and, and people really enjoy hearing your point of view because I, I, I think it's an important one. Thank you. Yeah. All right, my friend, take care. <laughs> yeah, Jay, thank you so much. All right, everybody, that is it for this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Adam. Uh, I always enjoy talking to him. Uh, hopefully you made it through the, the entire three and a half, four hours, whatever it turns out to be. Um, but I think he shared a lot of really beautiful information, a really unique point of view, uh, and, and really drawing on, on many, many years of experience. Um, so uh, I, I hope and think this will be a, a really enlightening and, and beneficial conversation for you all. Um, as always, if you're able to support the show, Patreon is a really uh, beautiful option. It's a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. You can sign up and it gives you things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. That's a really big help to me, to all the people who have done that. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. If you're able to do that, thank you very much for the support. There's also the option of direct donating via PayPal. I'll put a link to both of those in the show notes. If you're not able to do that, Subscribing to the show on YouTube is really big help. Turning on the notification bell, liking the video, that's a really big help in getting the show out to a bigger and broader audience. And then with the audio version, going on Apple Podcasts, subscribing to the show, leaving a starred rating and a short review, that's also a really big help. To all the people who have done that, thank you very much. If you're able to do that, thank you very much. 
Um, I'm not sure my next guest coming up. Uh, I'm not exactly sure of the order, but as always, there'll be some really interesting people coming on. So thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for the support, and I will see you all on the next episode.